everyone to Manhattan Community Board 1's Transportation Street Activity Permit Committee for October 2021. Uh, I'm Betty Kay, the chair of the committee. I'm joined by Michael Francoeur, who is the co-chair. And not showing at all, Lucian Reynolds, the district manager. So this with this committee. Uh, if I go to the next slide, we have a fairly full agenda tonight. Uh, we're going to follow Robert's rules. The committee members will speak before the public. Everyone will have plenty of time to speak, so that's not a problem. So don't be worried about that. Uh, and I'm going to start off, first of all, with Jen Leung, who's here, who can do some of the updates from the DOT. So, Jen, if you'd like to speak. All right, thank you, Betty. Next slide. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Lee Young, DOT Manhattan Borough Commission's Office. I have a couple of updates. Uh, I'll start with some of the uh, traffic control requests that we received in the past through resolutions that you guys passed and sent to us. Um, the first location is uh, Rector and Washington Street. The request was for a multi-way stop control. It was approved and it should have been installed already. Um, the other one that I have is um, Pex up in front. That was a stop sign request. At the time when we received this, we were not able to do the study, but since then there has been the Pexla Park uh, reconstruction project. Um, that started in January of 2020 and it was completed uh, sometime this year. So that intersection is no longer like vehicles can't get through. The park is now there connected now. So we didn't, we were not able to do a study there. Um, my thing, I guess the question maybe is to ask if there's still a need for a uh, stop sign at that, uh, you know, it's a T intersection now. I guess that's a question I would like to ask. And my third uh, one that I have is for Beekman and Water. That stop sign request was actually denied. And I think we actually sent a letter out for that denial of uh, in June, uh, not June, July of this year. It was, I've seen it. Okay. So those are the uh, traffic control requests. Um, then I also have an update for the Lower Manhattan Pedestrian Priority Street study. The study was actually paused during the uh, pandemic. Uh, we are planning to resume the study with our consultants this fall. Uh, when it's available, we will try to share it and update a timeline. And if there are any changes and modif modifications to the scope, we'll also share that at that time. Uh, and last but not least, I know um, between community boards one, two, and three, the Canal Street study, our pedestrian unit will start to uh, look into it, and uh, there might be a, a upcoming proposal. I mean, I, I, it's, there's no time frame for when that's going to be available, but uh, we're going to start looking at it. And I believe that's all I have for now. Well, that's good news. Patrick, did you have any questions about the pedestrian priority? Sorry, just trying to load up my video. Uh, no, I mean, it, just getting a better sense of the timing would be helpful, but um, appreciate that things seem to be going in a positive direction. Thank you for that. Not a problem. Yes, and I will look in and ask around about the uh, slip in front to see if there's still a need or not, because I, I don't have an answer for that one. Okay, well, thank you, Jen. No other questions. I don't see any hands. We'll go on to Titus School. Issue of the pickups and drop offs there. And again, this is a follow up to Natalie's June 21st presentation. I'm going to the next slide, just because some of you are new since then. Uh, just so you can see where the school is located, it's on John Street. Uh, it is east of Gold Street. But before you get to Cliff Street, which dead ends into John Street. So we're going to be talking about going from William Street to Pearl Street. Go to the next slide. Situation what it looks like on the ground. The uh, traffic signal traffic sign on the block is three hour commercial vehicle parking only. And there's scaffolding. If you go to the next one. You can see it's really all placards. It's not really used for commercial parking. Uh, and the businesses in the area have really, they're using other areas. So this is really just placard parking. But that still means the buses can't get curb access. And as you can see here, this is a group of people from the school who are trying, who are there at the end of the school day to sh help shepherd the children between the sidewalk and the school buses. 
that are out in the one lane. To go to the next one. Next slide. You can see there is just one moving lane on John Street. So when the buses are stopped and there are 13 of them, correct, Natalie? There are 13, there might be more, um, but there's a school bus driver shortage. So we currently have students um, who are not receiving transportation services that should be receiving transportation services. Um, when so we finished last, more. yeah. And when we, so when we finished last year, we finished with about um, like 65 students and now we have 83. Okay, so we're talking about a significant number of buses that need to pull up into the area. And when they can't get access to the sidewalk is the problem and the back up on John Street. You go to the next, here you can see it's going for more than one block. And it's kind of interesting because again, since if you go back to the one you just on, since I'm a mobility scooter user, yeah, you can see the way the door is located, uh, you can't get through the scaffolding or it, it would be hard for a lot to do that. So it probably can't be unusual that they get dropped off in the street, which is usually what happens to me. Is that correct? Even if they're in the middle of the block, they have to get to a Yes, this truck. actually is a bus with a lift, so that larger back door. So we have right. two non-ambulatory students that take this school bus. And we will have a third in a couple of weeks once their, you know, uh, transportation services are organized. And so this bus has a backdoor lift that opens up that lowers to the ground so that the students can um, be, you know, their strollers or their wheelchairs can be rolled on and off the um, the bus. And and this becomes a little bit more of a of a hassle because it takes longer for this to happen and it causes a, a significant delay. So if this bus could pull up to the curb, it, would, it wouldn't block traffic nearly as much and it would also be much safer for everybody involved. Yeah, no, it's, it's, believe me, I have the same problem. I get left in the middle of the street all the time, in the middle of the block, even when it's near the school. If I can't get near the curb, I have to wheel through traffic to find a curb cut somewhere so I can get on the sidewalk. So, you know, it, it is. Yeah, and then we have to lift. Most of the time we end up trying to lift them up to get, you know, we need two or three people to lift them over the curb to get them in because we can't get them close enough to a curb cut. Which has its own problems. It's really hard as a person with a limited mobility to be treated like a sack of potatoes. So it, it would be better if they could get to the curb so they could feel a little more control of their own mobility. Yes. But on to the next one, because I think that's about it. Oh, the, the video, because we had two different people submit them to give people a sense of what it looks like after school. And just so you can see, this came from Cora from the councilwoman's office. So you can see the backup going on Gold Street as they try to get onto John Street, as well as John Street back towards William Street, which you're seeing here. Today, Patrick. As you can see it. You can pick your random day, and you're going to have the same congestion occurring, and the same horn honking occurs. It's really a daily event. We had a student elope from his school bus recently, where you know we're. We're very hands on, so we're right there, but this was an overwhelming situation. They were waiting for such a long time and the, the honking and, you know, their kids on the bus started to cry. And so it became a situation where the student fled the bus and we had to chase after them. Um, and that's something that is just terrible and dangerous and could be grave uh, in its results. And we don't want to have to. Um, you know, parents are just trying to send their, their kids to school. And so we don't want to ever have to make a phone call that somebody got gravely injured or had, uh, were hit by a car or something horrible happened because they were so dysregulated by their morning drop off or their afternoon drop off that it, it caused such distress. Uh, no question. And even from a very selfish point of view, uh, to the drivers, it doesn't help the situation and them speeding up the way they want to. So it just doesn't work for anybody. 
it's terrible for the neighborhood too. Yeah, no, I, the, the honking. Yeah, I'm sure. It's... Did you want to speak to the groups that have supported you on this? I know you were talking to the kinder care on the corner as well. I mean, we haven't had anybody object to it. I think everybody is desperate for a resolution um, and everybody is, you know, open to various options. Um, we, we just need to know like what would be the best for, from the traffic flow standpoint. And that's something that we can't, you know, like we know that that gold is a one way and that cliff is a one way and there's no access to cliff except from John street. And so there are certain limitations to um, what we what we can or should request based on the directions of streets. And so we're we're eager to we'll we'll do we'll accept any solution. But we're we're eager to know sort of like flow of traffic wise what's available to us because we can't eliminate uh, access to Cliff Street. Right. And Patrick, did you want to speak for the neighborhood neighbors? Association. Yeah, I, I, a couple of things. So first of all, the honking is an issue, but it, that that's a mere inconvenience and annoyance, um, and and really not the main issue. The safety of the students, number one, is is paramount, and given the vulnerability of that population, um, it's clear something has to be done. The um, convenience of drivers, I guess we could live with that, or or you know deal with it. It is important, but um, the safety of other pedestrians who are walking around and dealing with aggravated drivers, et cetera, that, that, and it's at the same time as kids are coming home from Peck, Peck Slip School and other schools in the area. And um, the, the kinder care um, at uh, 99 John. So it's a, it's a complete mess and a, and a dangerous one at that to Natalie's point. Um, not just because of the sensory issues of our student population or, you know, the fact that some of them may bolt, but, you know, you get aggressive drivers in situations like this. They get very angry and it's, it's, it's just a recipe for disaster. So, uh, the neighborhood association, I can tell you fully supports the shared street model, uh, between William street and cliff street. Um, I've spoken to the board at 80 John street, who's supportive of the concept would like to see more details on how that ultimately works out, including potentially, um, a residential loading zone in front of 80 John, um, which would cover 80 in, in the residential building across the street, 85 John and in front of 99 John street. Um, we think that model probably works the best because what it would do is eliminate um the the placard parking situation that really causes the the congestion in the first place even if we put no parking no standing school zone get out of here you'll be towed you'll be whatever you're still going to get somebody who's going to park there i think and that's going to be a real problem uh because even though nypd traffic is located two doors down at 66 john street there's next to no enforcement when it comes to those issues so i think We've looked at this from a lot of different angles, and I appreciate that Natalie is looking at this as an educator um, and school administrator from a number of different angles and what toolbox the DOE may have as well. But I think for all the constituencies together, the best one um, we're going to be able to uh, accommodate everybody is a shared street type of model because that will keep traffic flowing on the streets. It won't close those streets off, which is the way circulation is around this particular spot. Uh, I think very difficult, if not impossible, but um, there's a solution I think that works for everybody and we've laid it on the table. No, I agree. And I've spoken downtown Alliance would support a shared street. They will not support a street closure. We have no objection to that. And we, um, we believe that all of our neighbors would be in support of it. And we know that our building owner and landlord would be in support of it at, at 90 John street. Yes, because getting them down to five miles per hour uh, is the objection of moving beyond. This is back to Patrick to go from John from sorry from Cliff Street to Pearl Street a problematic. I, I just I don't I'm, know. I can tell you there's one residential building, 116 John Street. Um, there's the postal service that would be impacted, but I'll be quite honest. Who cares? Because they don't. They're not subject to DOT rules. They're not subject to DOT or NYPD enforcement. They're terrible um, neighbors when it comes to how the streets and sidewalks work. Uh, there are a few businesses along there that we should survey to make sure that they're okay with it. Um, I can tell you that uh, uh, Stout 
which is a business at the corner of John and Gold, um, has uh, always been a very supportive neighbor and a good neighbor. Um, I, I, I can't speak to the other businesses, though, if it were to go down to Pearl, uh, but I can't imagine m much objection because it, they don't rely on, they rely on foot traffic. They don't rely on folks who are coming and parking to get to their business with the exception of the Postal Service, and they've got Pearl Street and Platt Street that they can and do park and operate from. They don't need John Street, in other words. Yeah, I think that we could make the argument for them that foot traffic being increased would increase business for them in many ways. I think because what you're, you know, what we have seen is that uh, the the blocking we're not interfering with deliveries or anything like that. Um, we've looked at, you know, we've looked at the delivery times and what and where trucks are parking, and it doesn't seem to interfere if we're doing a shared street or even if we even if we did a street closure, it doesn't seem to interfere. But a shared street. Um, because they have access to clip and gold that it has, it hasn't seemed to be an issue because they can't, they can't get down John street anyway, um, for deliveries at those times. And so that's, that's how they've been navigating it. Yeah. And I think that's why the downtown Alliance was in agreement with it. They had no objection. So is there any problem? Cause I, I looked at the school street and that slowed only to 25 miles per hour. It wouldn't change things from the way they are now, really. Um, it may help a little bit if Jen Lung has any comments about how we can stop the parking. Any great insights, Jen? Just to eliminate parking? Um, On that one block, at least, in front of the school. I think that's going to be tough. Um, I was wondering, like, when you say shared streets, do you mean the open streets that we have, the open streets program, where there's two different types? I was actually thinking the shared street, which is five miles per hour, and yeah. the bikes, the people, everyone share the street. Yeah, Whatever that, gets that's... the corners off, I mean, to, to open that lane up so that cars can pass while the buses are loading. That's the key. Well, right. well this right. is the thing. For the open streets with the temporary limited local access, that that stops tra through traffic from entering that particular street, but it does allow- They don't want to do that. You don't want to do that? No, Downtown Alliance wants through traffic. They want through traffic? I think you need through, through traffic, traffic but they want the buses to be able to get out of the traffic. You line. need through what, traffic, Natalie's no, right. What I'm saying is that with the temporary local, limited local access, there will be barriers at each end, and the vehicles that are allowed through that street would be the the school buses will be able to get through and only other businesses that need to get through. Like it would not be like anyone who's driving around would not be able to get through. That's what I'm saying. Does that eliminate though parking? Unfortunately it does not. I mean parking that's will what, remain. I think that's the bigger issue is right. the placard parking, parking in front of the building. So it says three hour commercial parking and it is 99.9% .9 placard parking okay. all the time. I think the parking might be something on the side. It will be a, a curb red change. So maybe we might need to do two different things. It might be a curb red change and then also maybe an open street with the limited access. Hi, Betty. I just wanna just jump in really quick. Um, the, the the school bus park, I have a question for Jennifer. Um, the school bus parking curbside regulation that's being proposed or was requested by the Titus School, are placards, technically allowed to park in those zones as well? They should not be. Okay, because I know that they can park in loading zones yeah. and other sorts of zones, but they, they're technically not supposed to park in the, the school, school does, zone? The, yeah, does, doesn't it, like there are signs that says uh, for school only or um, school faculty, they're not supposed to be there. Okay, thanks. Okay, so that's kind of what we're asking for. Is that a park? Is that a no parking? The shared street would work great to slow everybody down because there is so much pedestrian traffic moving all those children, not just to Titus, but to the two child care centers across the street. And I think this is one do of the rare drive. opportunities. Go ahead, Natalie. Sorry. Sorry, I just say people do drive way too fast down the street um when when we're done loading and unloading or, and dismissing an arrival and things like that and the buses aren't blocking traffic 
there's no there's no stop signs or anything in that area and people do drive very very fast down john street when, when it's open, they absolutely do. I can confirm that for Natalie. I, I was going to say that I think this is a spot that there's a need for the two to work together. Jennifer, the the shared streets along with shared street along with um, the adjustment to the parking regulations and enforcement of those. Um, it, it, there um, is widespread support among the Downtown Alliance, a neighborhood association, neighboring buildings, neighboring businesses this key stakeholder of the Titus School. Um, and it's really a, a an opportunity for DOT to show proof of concept for something like this within the financial district, within these tight streets. It's just, it's a perfect place to do this. Okay. Actually, a pretty inexpensive temporary changes could be made until capital funds are found to change the actual roadbed color. Yeah, and I, I would just recommend you know, my, my professional recommendation to you to you all for consideration. Um, many schools have found a lot of success in the limited access or the, the local access uh, uh, open street that where uh, during student drop off and student pick up the, the streets are closed with barriers uh, only permitting the buses and any other kind of deliveries or you know, people who have business on the block to enter the street, um, especially in the short term where, um, A, you're waiting for the curbside regulations to change, and B, when they do change, you're waiting for the enforcement to catch up with the new reality because when the DOT does come and change, this, change the signs, I guarantee you the people who have been accustomed to parking in that, on that block will not change their habits um, and, it is a crapshoot as to when uh, the the police will catch up with enforcement if the next administration is um, uh, uh, inclined to, to press on um, uh, even enforcement of placard abuse. So the, the 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 limited access street, I think, would would provide the most immediate relief uh, to the condition that's presented here today. But then, what do you do about Cliff Street? You're cutting off all access to a street. Cliff Street is a one way that you can only get onto from John Street, unless they retrain the traffic. But I, I don't know that that's going to happen either. I think that you know that's just as long far off as any other solution. If Jennifer, does Betty, DOT have a any question kind of it, solutions for something like this? It's something we could definitely take a look at. My other question is that what happens if this limited access is only during Arrival and dismissal. Because regular traffic could, you know, during those times not come through this way and get to the cliff. I mean, they could go around. Well, I mean, they won't be able to go around, but, you know, I just think how it's a to do that. How can we get rid of the people parking during those hours? Oh. That's the tough one. Couldn't but people come? That's exactly what there stay? is now. What was that? Otherwise, it would I'm be sorry. exactly like it is now. You can see how backed up it is. If they just have school staff be responsible for taking barriers up and down as the various buses pull in and out, uh, it's just giving them work without changing anything for traffic, without changing anything for the children. Because we thought about that in the first place. Mm -hmm. But it creates its own. So that, that's why I think. That's why I think it's got to be a full-on shared street, street model with. Um, amendments to the parking regulations and then you know we'll have to get used to it and adjust to it um, and of course like with any pilot we sort of work through what works what doesn't work and and pick through those pieces this is just it's one of the rare times i've seen such a desire among all the constituencies to do the very same thing and get the very same outcome it just screams out for a shared street with um, manipulated parking regulations I agree. And the school zone things that I looked at examples on the DOT website and others were all two way streets. They weren't one way streets. With one way street coming off of it as well, that would be blocked. It's just a different situation as well. Hi, um, can I ask a question? My name is Eric. I uh, sure I'm going to have, I was going to say, uh, yeah. 
Let's go down. I was going to take it by name. Michael first, then Eric, then Mitch, then Pat, and then Mariana. Sure. sure. Yeah, I was just going to throw in, um, I think similar to what Lucian was saying. Uh, I, I completely support efforts to go ahead and change parking regulations and try to get a shared street. But I do know that those processes, since they go through um, DOT and whatever the process, or actually whatever the process is, I'm assuming that that's going to take a period of time. But again, correct me if actually a question to Jen would be how long usually would it take to approve something like that? Um, and my thinking being perhaps it's or there's like a two pronged approach here where we advocate for or try to install some sort of um, school. Uh, I forget the name of the program, but where you're blocking off access um, to only uh, allow school buses and, and, you know, other delivery vehicles during school loading zone times. So that way there's some immediate relief. I know it doesn't address the parking, um, but I'm not sure again. Uh, if we will be able to address the parking, um, unless uh, the city gets serious about um, enforcing that, and at the same time, also allow these processes for updated parking regulations and shared street going through. That's my thinking, but then I'll turn it over to Jen to see if she has an, an idea of how long that process might take. The open streets application would be the quickest. Mm -hmm. Current regs will take some time. I would say at least, you know, two months at least minimal. Um, for the share street, that's going to be a longer process because there's a lot of planning and design that will have to go into it. Got it. So, yeah, that's that would be my um, thought is go for the open street since that's in some immediate relief. I know it's not mm -hmm. every, what, what everyone wants, everything that everyone wants, and then see if we can start the process for uh, approval of these other things. But that's my two cents. Back to you, Betty. Uh well, next actually is Eric. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I think that it should a small step would be just to change change the uh, remove the commercial loading and make it a uh, like a, a bus a bus stop. Um, I'm thinking also that I'd like to know what type of placards are parking there. I mean, um, they probably get there very early. So even if if you do do a a situation where the the school staff would would close off traffic during loading zone, you know, during loading and boarding time. I'm sorry, uh, unloading and loading times. They're probably or they'll already be there in the morning. Um, also, regarding the, uh, the, uh, the the buses when they're you know you know low you know discharging children or picking them up, the the stop sign will come out, so they're going to block traffic anyway. Um, and you know, I, for me, I think have, keeping it open. You know, controlled and safe for the children, but still keeping the street open for traffic is essential. I mean, it still is a commercial district, but um, I, I just as long as the buses have a place to stage, I think that'll help out the school. Um, and then to have it so that that we can maybe load multiple, you know, maybe two or three buses at one time can can you know discharge and and you know load the children at the same time. Thank you. Thanks. That is the hope. Uh, Mitch, then Pat. Are you muted, Mitch? If I see a Mitch, I do see you. You're muted. Mitch, I unmuted you. I'm sorry. Uh, so, Natalie, unlike you know the uh, uh, a crossing guard that just helps the kids cross, has there ever been a traffic enforcement person like they might station on Canal Street by the Holland Tunnel? You know that that you know when somebody like that in uniform is is around, sometimes certain things are mitigated as far as the behavior of of you know. Uh, have you ever thought about that, or is that something that would might uh, not work over there? We have had uh, recently, there have been a lot of um, NYPD traffic cars parked outside as well. And, and there have been officers nearby. I mean, the other day I had an officer to have his uh, putting lights and sirens on to get us to move faster. No, I'm talking about like a human being standing. like. Standing no, I know. I, I don't, it's, I don't know that it, the only thing that's really going to help us 
is going to be clearing bashes. the curb. Okay. And we can't clear the curb, right? We can't, we have to get the buses on the curb in right. order to make it safer for the students to get on and off the bus, as well as to alleviate the deadlock that we cause. And unfortunately, the, 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 the suggestions that everybody's making about changing the parking regulations, I couldn't agree more, but you can change the every regulation you want to make it as restrictive as possible, but it's like, unless uh, placards are enforced, nothing's going to change. So uh, the other thing is, I think Patrick had mentioned about like when there aren't the buses there the, and there's no stop sign, cars are just speeding up and down. I, I mean, just up, not up and down. Would would anybody be for a low grade speed bump, one or two speed bumps there? It's not great for everybody, but it does work in certain situations. I don't know how, how, how you feel about that, Natalie or, or Betty. It doesn't bother I, me. I, I don't know well, how I, easy of a solution that is. Well, no, I, I'm not, I know I they help can, the, but I'm talking about what Patrick street, said they, as far as speeding. They, no, they interfere with bus bottoms is why they're not city buses. So I know that's why they're not put in many locations. Okay, and then the other thing, I just, one other thing that, from what I remember a few months ago, I think it was Natalie or somebody else from the school, because that like, you know, when Patrick had mentioned about the honking that, yes, it is, it, it is an inconvenience to, you know, to us, but my understanding was that they have some, and I hope I don't know if I'm using the right terms, emotionally disturbed children at the school where honking does affect them clinically and, and scares them and makes them afraid. So the honking for those few students that have that disability is more than an annoyance. Am I not correct on that, Natalie? It, you're correct, yes. You know, I, we do have students who have uh, very sens sensitive sensory processing disorders and, and auditory processing and sa loud sounds can be frightening. They can be right. dysregulating. Um, the waiting and, and being on the school bus and, and the not the idling and waiting can be anxiety producing. Yeah. Um, the, the, the problem is, is that the solution is going to take enforcement, right. right? So we know the solution. The solution is that we have to change the curb reg and we have to slow the traffic down. That's going to take a significant amount of time. But in order to get rid of the placard parking, we have to have somebody who's willing to enforce it. Right. Okay. Thank you. And Pat, and then Mariama. Yeah, I'm sorry. I may have missed this uh, about Cliff Street, which I'm sitting on right now at work. Um, you know, Cliff Street is a, a very tiny street. It already has issues. It's got two parking lots on it at the entrances to two different parking lots right across the street from one another. And there are a lot of businesses on Cliff Streets that, that need deliveries. So I'm not sure that I heard closing of Cliff Street. Is that what I heard? We're trying to avoid that because we're the only source, we're the only access point to Cliff. So we right. can't close. Yeah. No, can't close so, Cliff. Yes, yeah, so everyone agrees that John Street can't really be closed because no. of the access to Cliff Street. Exactly. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Mariama and then Patrick. Um, I was wondering if anyone had considered maybe the buses stopping on further down John, like between Pearl and Water, or stopping on Pearl, which is a small street too, but a little wider than John. Um, and then you would still be on that same side of the street where the Titus School is. They, they, can't, they have to drop off in front of the school because it's the law. So the, the service is door to door for these students. They get picked up at their school and they get brought to our door. They get picked up at their home and brought to our door um, because of their diagnoses, disabilities and needs. And, and the service is door to door and that's uh, illegally, they have to be within a certain amount of feet from our front door. I see, because I mean, I think Mitch said something similar. The, the problem with changing um parking regulations when you're talking about placards is that the only people that are going to be affected by changing of parking regulations is residents after you know after hours you know um because placards still park wherever they're going to park whenever they want to park um i don't you you can like after four o'clock you could park wherever you want to park like between eight and four though we need the the area clean so i would i would be fine with it being a no standing zone during school hours, but
But again, that that requires enforcement. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's already like you can't park there until I think six o'clock. Um, you know, but so the people that are parking there are not they're not the residents. The residents don't start parking there until after work. Yeah, they're, they're, all, they're already people who are using placards. They're already it's, com it's commercial now. I know it's placards, really, but the commercial restriction that would that would hesitate the residents is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. currently. Yeah, right. Well, there are some commercial things. There's a grocery store in the corner of right. Jubilee um, Market, but they don't use it. They've said they don't. Yeah, and there's um, as Pat was saying, all those places on Cliff. There's also a UPS on Cliff that has a lot of. It's very busy. There's a post office on John. So. I don't think it's a very narrow street unless you're doing something again between Pearl and yeah, Water. All the parking, right. all the parking in front of our building is placard parking from the Department of Transport, um, from the Department of Buildings and um, whatever other state agencies are on John Street. That's the parking. It's yeah, not that's what I figured. commercial. It's not UPS. It's not USPS. It's not 7-Eleven. It's not Jubilee, and it's not Kinder Care. It's all DOB and uh, whatever gov other government agencies are on John Street, um, but on the Gold William side of John Street. Yeah, no, I agree. That's what I figured. But if, if you displace them, then they're going to displace the post office, the UPS, the people on Cliff Street. You know, so it, it's a. It, they have to go somewhere. Yeah. Or they could commute some other way because these are personal cars. They could access one of those many lots you spoke about. Right, or they could take mass transit. But anyway, uh, Natalie, you're saying 8 a.m. is fine. You don't need it before then. Students or arrive at 8.30, like school starts at 8.30. I mean, okay. 8, 8 a.m. would be cutting it close, but we can manage it because we're, we're, the staff doesn't start arriving until 8 a.m. anyway. So the students arrive at 8.30 and they're dismissed at 3 o'clock. Okay, so 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. works for you? Yeah, we could do, yeah, I think I think 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. is the safest bet. Okay, so I, I want to confirm the times with you that worked for you. Yes. Thank you. Well, just a heads up, Betty, I do see that Patrick has his hand up next. Yes, no, Patrick was next. Um, yeah, so just a, a, several quick I'll try to make a quick points um, in response to some of the things that I've heard. So, um, first of all, with regard to the um, parking times and whether residents really use it, residents are, are really unable to use it, Nariyama. So, um, it, it's after 7 p.m. is when the commercial loading zone ends on weeknights. Um, as somebody who owns a car, I can tell you nobody, very few, if any, people are able to really make use of those parking spaces because, as Natalie pointed out, in, and this is not just been very recent this has been going on for a long time it's nypd nypd traffic at 66 john nypd at 1 pp and other placards are just taking those things overnight so not even the commercial vehicles are getting to park there those that are getting deliveries like the grocery store at um, jubilee are getting them on the gold street side um, so I don't think they'd be affected by the reduction of parking. If there were any real residential parking spaces lost, they're fewer than a dozen. Um, to the Mitch's point about um, speed bumps and um, traffic calming, I, th I think that's really the point is that a shared street, one of the components of a, tra a shared street are traffic calming measures. It may not be speed bumps, it may not be the exact treatment, but something that gets people to sort of to slow down in that area. Pat, to your point about Cliff Street, it can't be closed off. There's just no way. There, there are too many things that need to be accessed within that area. Um, that's why a shared street model, I think, makes um, the most sense. Um, and then now I've forgotten the final point that I was gonna make, but um, it, again, I think it, it just comes down to the shared street and parking regulations and enforcement make the most sense. And while yes, enforcing um, placard rules are, are important, it's just one piece of the puzzle. Um, so I think ke keeping this a, a little bit broader than just um, enforcing no placard parking during certain hours because placards might park there, that, that's that's important, but it's it's gotta be something a little bit more than that to really make this work and to make it work for everybody.
yes, and Pat, did you have something more to say or is your hand just still up? Pat Moore? I gotta take it down again, sorry. <laughs> okay, great. That sounds like everyone has spoken. To get down to the end, I'll show you what, because we have heard this before, so it wasn't a complete surprise to me. Michael, can you progress them? I put some of the things together for a resolution. Sure, we'll do. I think I saw Mariama put her hand back up again. Did you have something else to oh, add, Mariama? Sure. Would you like to speak? Well, I was just thinking for a second. I didn't really form it into a question, though. I, I live on gold, and um, and I drive too. So, and obviously, I don't need since I live on gold. I don't need to drive to John very often. But sometimes, if I do, let's say I, I take um, friends from, you know, wherever, not this neighborhood, Jersey. I take them to Ryan's. So I'm going to pull my car out. I'm going to drop them. I'm going to park over there. I've, I've done it before. I'm going to park on John and, and walk into the bar restaurant. Um, but on gold, coming down whatever time of day, pretty much, um, particularly when there's deliveries, people already have to park um, halfway the street, halfway the sidewalk. Gold is probably the smallest of all of the streets that we're discussing. So if we're going to be backing people up onto gold, to do to make room on John, that's going to be a problem. It, it's already a problem. Like you know, a fire truck and stuff can't fit down that street. Yeah, no, they're currently backed up onto Gold because there's no curb access, and that slows the buses down. Because moving the children from the bus to the sidewalk between parked cars just slows things up, especially those who use wheelchairs. If I can, I would just say that the, those deliveries are happening on gold all the time. It is a huge problem, and it's especially exacerbated when um, 33 gold, for example, has major pileups of garbage. It just forces everybody into the street. Mariam is 100% right. That block is a nightmare. It's one of the narrowest spaces. And then when you go between John and Platt Street because of the scaffolding, it's it's even worse. But that just to me is a more of a reason for a more holistic approach those deliveries aren't aren't just going to suddenly occur on john street they're they're going to continue on gold street until we do something uh, bigger and broader but I agree with you mariana so glad there'll be a bigger study of the area that's very welcome but hopefully we can keep a little bit more moving on gold if john street had access to the curb for the school children so there were a number of programs, but there are drawbacks to all of them. And that's why I just list some of the ones out there potentially. Um, but the problem with the no parking school zone, uh, it still would allow some placards and traffic is only slowed to 20 miles per hour, which wouldn't help all the pedestrians arriving with strollers it, to the various children preschool centers. The school year 21-22's outdoor learning initiative would close John Street to traffic during school hours, and that's a no-go from really any of the groups that live in the area. So that's a problem. Let's go to the next one. It seems like kind of the best of the limited choices and what everyone seems to agree on and what I'd be asking you to vote on. So please respond with what you want dropped, changed, whatever to ask the department DOT to calm traffic by making John Street a shared street, which would be the five miles per hour speed limit that prioritizes pedestrians between William and Pearl Street. And Patrick, do you want it to go to just to uh, Cliff? Um. I mean, I'd welcome the thoughts of the committee on that. I, I think bringing it all the way down to Pearl is is fine, but to be fair, we haven't visited with those constituencies and, and the big ones are 116 John, a residential building and 111 John, a commercial building. Um, there are a couple of businesses, 7-Eleven, Subway, um, along that block. And there's a new development coming uh, next to 100 John, but I, you know, I, I can't speak for them, I just don't know. Okay, the advantage of it is the advantage of going the one block 
you know, farther east, is that you had so many children arriving at the children's the preschools yeah. that are coming from that direction, and they're really squeezed with what to do and with frantic traffic. Right. I, I think it's the right thing to do. I think that's probably the right solution. So should we ask for it and see what we get back from the DOT? I definitely would support them. Okay, well, I'd say Downtown Alliance was fine with that too. Uh, and the other part for DOT, prohibit all parking on the south side of John Street between Gold and Cliff. So not the whole length, but just the area that the school itself is actually on. Uh, from 7 a.m. and actually I'll, that'll be changed to 8 a.m. Uh, I, you know, I think that if we're going to make sure that there are no cars there, yes. I like I would say 8 a.m. is going to cut it close, right? Somebody's going to be late to move their car. So you're probably right to do 7 a.m. Okay, so make it 7 a.m. and go to 4 p.m. Yes. So I will change that so everyone knows it's 7.30 a.m. Like it's, and so we're changing it by half an hour on either side, being a half hour later on either side. Yes. So the buses can have curb access rather than having to block the through traffic on the north side of John Street while the children enter and exit the buses. And next one. Next slide. Be it further resolved, we ask the DOT to consider John Street in the context of the master plans mandate to add pedestrian space, which will be part of this pedestrian prioritization that, in fact, Jen just announced they're going to get back to looking at that. And also to implement the pedestrian friendly shared street as soon as possible using temporary measures while capital funds are sought to construct a proper shared streetscape. And Michael, this is in concern to same as you. Like, capital expense for a shared street is going to take some time, but just on Whitehall, they could do something temporary. It would be lower okay, cost sure. and more immediate. Is this something we could fundraise for? Because I have so many people who would give money to this. I can talk. To, we can talk to the DOT later to negotiate once this is passed to see what they say. Uh, the bigger issue is what they did on Whitehall Street or next to the Bull, if you think of it that way. Uh, they simply changed the signage to five miles per hour and allow the different groups to mingle, the pedestrians, the bicyclists, the cars. So it's not that they haven't done it before with a temporary fix to the shared street. They have. Sure, and Betty, just a heads up, I see that Eric and Mariama have their hands up. Ah, uh, yes. And we can go in that order. Eric, then Mariama. I just I just want to reiterate again that that when buses are loading um, by law, they have to open up that stop arm comes out. So they're going to block traffic anyway. I mean, which is fine, but they're going to stop traffic as they load or unload students. That's that's the rule. Not the necessarily, operator. though, because we are are loading on the same side. So if they're all on the curb. You know what I mean? They're, no one's crossing in front of the bus. So the 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 lights go on, but the stop sign doesn't necessarily come out unless students are crossing in front of the bus. Okay. All right. If the bus operator agrees to that, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Um, and I, I'm looking, I know that street the, does do the cars go more than five miles an hour. Anyway, it, it seems pretty slow. You know, the traffic, uh, you know, there's, there's usually congestion. Yes. There are times where I, I've heard cars like speeding down the street and it's been there are times where it's just we we can't allow our we don't well we don't allow our students to go anywhere anyway but you know if we have a fire drill and we're walking down toward pearl street like when we get to the corner there we have to make sure that like no one is steps a toe outside of the crosswalk walk because it can be very dangerous and and we cross a lot over on gold street and there's no stop sign there and there's no um there's there's like a, a dip in the curb, but there's no crosswalk or anything. So there's nothing indicating that this is a pedestrian right away passageway and people don't slow down. 
they're definitely going over the what would be an appropriate speed limit for the size of the street and the the traffic the foot traffic okay. and there are the two other centers across the street that are facing the same difficulty and, and i can confirm as a resident who lives at 80 john street within this exact area it day and night whether i'm walking my dog or whatever and it's not just during the school day yes the second that street opens up it's a, it's like a drag racing uh, uh strip people just feel the need to free themselves and take their aggression out and speed it right up. It's amazing. So one of the one of the things about this versus the open street was that we could hopefully try to change behavior because it would be 24 seven that we'd have the shared street context, not, not just certain hours of certain days. And this school does, Titan school does go all year round and I'm gonna assume Infant centers are pretty much the same because they're probably working parents. Very good point. Uh, Mariama? Are you able to add a bullet point on the previous page that the parking would be returned to the residents after the four o'clock so that the uh, DOC doesn't do something strange with it? The signage would just be between 7.30 and 4 o'clock. Well, I, I guess I'm asking that we make sure that, that that's what the signage is and that they don't, you know, take advantage of the opportunity to add something else in there. Uh, it isn't now. It would simply designate a different group. There was right now, buses. there is parking there after... Well, I, I thought it was six. Patrick said seven. Whatever time it, it is, is there is parking. There is parking there for for residents, for people from the neighborhood. Now it would be after four p.m. Oh, okay. That's what I'm asking. Oh, are we get, can we state that we're asking for that to make sure? Uh, yes. No. That was was there for the times. And so instead of starting at seven in the morning, it'll start at seven thirty a.m. for the school, and rather than stopping at seven p.m. for the commercial. It will be 4 p.m. for the school zone. So, in fact, the residents would or others would have more hours. Okay, yeah, no, but that's what I'm asking. That's what I want to make sure of. Okay, I hope that they do it that way. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of problems. I've, I've been asking about can we get you know some things changed in that neighborhood for a long time? There's like parking meters till like 10, 11 o'clock on parts of John part, Maiden Lane, and it doesn't make any sense. But okay, that's another another topic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let me go to the next slide. We'll continue with this resolution. Uh, be it further resolved that we ask the DOT, okay, this we already did this one, to implement the friendly, and to ask the NYPD to monitor the area and quiet the honking, especially in a one block radius of John and Gold Street when school children are arriving or departing from school. So this is really where the noise comes from. Uh, the bus is trying to get down gold and the bus is trying to come up, coming across from John Street are the ones that are honking and they would help out by trying to change that behavior. And next, I think this is the end, but just in case. Yeah, and voting. Any other comments? And Eric, is your hand newly up or you have something oh, to say? Oh, pardon, I forgot to take it down. Okay, Michael. Yeah, the only other thing I wonder if you would consider or if the committee would consider adding um, is, you know, I really, you know, it pains me how uh, defeatist, like, we've become for, for a reason of, you know, for a good reason about, like, uh, the lack of enforcement of placard parking. Um, so I'm wondering if it's worth asking in a resolution like this, asking, you know, the mayor's office and the city council um, to do, to uh, to take action, um, whatever it would be to enforce parking um, enforcement uh, or just to enforce parking, uh, parking regulations, curb regulations. Um, and I, I was wondering, I know we've got uh, Cora from council member Chin's office on the line. I was just wondering if Cora knows of any existing efforts in the city council or proposed legislation that might help target um curb curb regulation curb enforcement that we um might not be aware of Where are you, are you mike hi michael 
Hey, Corey. Are you talking? Are you talking about curbside or the uh, enforcement? Yeah, just just any efforts that the city council that you're aware of, or the council member's office is aware of, that's targeting enforcement of um, of illegal parking. Um, whether I mean primarily placard parking because that's what really plagues our neighborhood. But um, even if it's broader than that, uh, I can find out from our legislative legislative director if there's any new bills introduced but if you recall last year the speaker speaker johnson and council member chin with her other colleagues passed a number of bills about placard parking and the one that was introduced by the council member is the three strike you're out um, the main one that was introduced by the speaker was about the placard information being digitized uh, because without that, you can't do the enforcement because it will be very hard to track down who's who has already had three strikes. And actually, last week we were talking, uh, our team was talking about it, and we're going to find out where we are with that process because that's under the speaker and also with the mayor's office. We're actually doing follow up to ask them where are we with this. For the enforcement well i can tell you that the nypd which used to have a small enforcement unit for placards uh, was defunded by the mayor and so was the dot's which was supposed to be starting up the placard enforcement and changing to the decal like placards and both of those were defunded by mayor de blasio referring to the follow-ups with the city council the central office about this legislation that was introduced so what happened we want to know too so yeah, no, I'll come I did to the mayor and he defunded that's what he did instead but yeah, I would only add it was defunded by the mayor in concert with the city council per their agreement yes so I'll come back to this uh, regarding the enforcement uh, with those bills it's not ideal it's not perfect but it helps a little bit but where are we in terms of implementation or what's the plan so i'll come back i'll ask our legislative director about that to thank come back you. to this thank, thank you. you and lucian your input on are we better off to add a resolution therefore be it resolved uh sorry and betty to uh sorry betty since i'm on the mic if i may add to one point Sure. The post, because earlier we talked about the post office at 114 John Street, that's like right before Pearl Street. And there is a designated authorized vehicle for the post office. They actually have the same problem because the designated spot is actually occupied by Parker Parking. On top of that, there's some kind of confusion because our office was working with Sergeant Secretaro with the NCOs. There's, there may be some kind of confusion where am I allowed to park? I think it's more likely just plain lack of enforcement because it's, uh, it's both. It's both. And really actually, horrible. this is something that I work on with the post office manager back two years ago, two or three years ago. And we actually brought it to the discussion with NYPD first precinct uh, in the last three months. This phenomenon actually recurred and the manager reached out. The reason I want to bring it up is I, I would love to connect you, uh, Lucian, with the post office manager because it really would help them. And if they know what's going on, like uh, 100 uh, or 500 yards ahead of them on John Street, I think she could be part of the conversation or see if she has something else to contribute as well because it, essentially it's going it actually affect their truck deliveries the post office workers performance as well right because if the, the truck got stuck by william then they can't get to the post office either and it will take them at least half an hour or an hour so i would love to connect you folks with manager and uh, i'll send the contact uh, via email so you you all have it and I will talk to the post office manager to give her heads up as well. Thank you. Thank you. And so I guess, Lucian, my question is the same, and it's in response to Michael's recommendation. Are we better off to do a separate resolution about placards and placard enforcement because of the incoming administration? Or to oh, yeah. just add something on here? 
I mean, we we have standing resolutions about I know the you know our our constant struggle against blocker parking. I would I would narrow this to what you're asking for, um, because you're aiming this at DOT specifically, um, because we we need to you know it's it's engineering over enforcement at this point. Um, we need DOT to to, to make it possible to get done what we need to get done um, because we're, we can't rely on enforcement um, for, for much of this. Um, and then we should pass something new once the new administration comes in. But I think this is because because we are we're trying to get DOT working on this specific street idea now. Let's let's get that going. That's my recommendation. I think that's fair. Yeah. Don't let me drag the conversation astray. Good, but but you will be held accountable, Michael, for reminding me because we will do this with the new administration, which is soon. For sure. And oh, uh, Betty, I do see that Mimi has her hand up. Yes, Mimi, please speak. And yeah, I um I wanted to kind of loop back to what uh, Mitch was saying about having um like a crossing guard or someone that can sort of manage traffic. Is that an option? Is, would it be possible to have? I know we have crossing guards uh, that we had talked about for the um, that pedestrian bridge situation on West Street, but um, is there anything that we could do here where we could have a person now? That's a bummer. We don't have. I'm going to leave it to Natalie, but there really isn't supposed to be any street crossing. Well, not necessarily street crossing. Is there like some way to just have crossing? It, it was traffic enforcement Mimi like you know they have like by the Holland Tunnel you know like a actual you know oh with flags and stuff yeah yeah I don't that, know what they would do I just kind of feel it's like not it's gonna like yeah a uniformed person just telling everybody to keep it down a little bit while kids are getting on buses I don't know well that's why the one is asking the NYPD to have someone at least occasionally stop by Okay, to stop by, not necessarily like ticket cars. I was imagining someone just like writing tickets and putting yeah, it on the placard cars. The, the only thing, the only thing that will work, and I hate to say this, somebody, you know, somebody that's honking like you know or speeding, and they get a ticket, you know, like they do a little blitz one or two days, the word gets out, just like they do blitzes for other things during the year, until they solve the placard problem, which I don't see that happening anytime soon. It's all about enforcement, like Natalie said. If they can give a couple of tickets to the speeders, to the hunkers, uh, word, word gets out. Well, that's why I will leave that to the NYPD. And I'm um, kind of with Lucian. There needs to be a resolution, but we might as well wait for the new administration. Sure. D because does, the current uh, one has made a stance to defund. I did read that thing that you were talking about when when they were going to do like a, a placard blitz and then like a week later or something they defunded what they were going to support the blitz for. Yes. So it's like it, it was just you know. <laughs> yeah. So let's vote on the resolution and. Right before you all vote, this real quick update on crossing guards. Uh, see, this district is having a horrible time finding crossing guards for schools. Um, mainly because it's a, it's a tough job to find people for. Um, it doesn't pay a lot, and they only work kind of two shifts per day with a large gap of time in between the shifts. So you need to kind of find people who that really fits their lifestyle and needs. So we're actually you know looking for ways to 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 find people and hook them up with an NYPD recruiter uh, so they can get trained and and be placed at schools in our district. So if you know anyone. Who is really looking more for, you know, a, a way to 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 make a difference and and bring safety to kids, not really a, as a way to make a lot of money because uh, that's not what they're going to do. Um, please let them know uh, that I'm looking for them, and I'll I'll happily um, uh, introduce them to an NYPD recruiter for that. Now, Lucian, is there any way of of uh... Any type of like raising the pay for the powers that be? Is there any movement, you know, to induce a, a, a higher pay standard for these people? It's been, I think, in past years we've made that a um, uh, an expense budget request. Um, but that's all we can do is ask for them to be paid. And then one other suggestion, you know, you know, sometimes like 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 young seniors 
that maybe have retired but don't want to just be sedentary, maybe like reaching out to some, some of them because this might be a perfect opportunity for somebody like in that uh, 65 to 75, you know, like range where like they don't want to just like, you know, just stay home, watch TV all day, but they want to do something, you know, even, but even though they're retired from their business. So, you know, like a senior, some, some type of uh, senior outreach might not be a bad idea for a, a, a position like that. Oh, that's right. And just not to belabor this, if there's anybody here who's listening, who is connected with a large group of active seniors, boy, uh, just reach out to me if you know anybody, if anybody here in this meeting is listening. Yep. Okay. Betty, back to you. Yes. And do you want to hold the vote? Okay. Is it you all? Um, made your yeah, would you like me to call the question or, or do I just you call the question, Betty? And I say, okay, yeah, I'm say, let's, since the conversation is done, I'm going to move to make a vote on this resolution. Sure. Then I'll second that. Okay. So all in favor. Say, aye. 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 Anyone aye. opposed? So you're not doing roll call. You want to do roll call? I can do roll call. I, I, no, I, no, no. I'm I'm fine without. I'm just just okay. I I think it's just full board where you have to do that for attendance. Yeah. Okay. Any 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 uh, opposed? Any abstentions? Any recusals? Okay. The motion passes. Great, and thank you for all your work. Thank Matt. you. We'll follow up to see what we have to do to negotiate. With yes, the thank you. And, and the right word. we have lots of people who want to give us lots of money with lots of very deep pockets. So if that helps anybody in any way, let us know. <laughs> let us know. Thank you very much for your time and for your efforts. We deeply, deeply appreciate it. Have a great night. Maybe you, you too. Can hire a private, oh, you private crossing guard with that. <laughs> really? Yes, and Jen, that's for you. You can uh, pass. We would get you a private. Lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Yes, that was for Jen. Okay. No greasing public servants. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Betty Shabazz is here. Shabazz is here. He's with us yes, now. And I have to say, is it Shabazz or Shabazz? Shabazz. I mean, Shab it's a it's an ongoing struggle, but one day I'll win. I was going to just introduce you as Sam, but I didn't have any coffee to have <laughs> give you. So. That, that's what that's very funny. That, that that is that is my alias in Starbucks and in all I places. know I just read that. And yes, you use that in your Twitter account too. But yes, I'd like to invite you to speak a little bit about secure biking, bike parking. And since I love your minis so much, I stole your picture from your website. Got it. Okay. I, I have a short presentation. Um sure, and Michael, it can Work with you on sharing screen with yeah, you. Yeah, let me see if I can or... do that. Yeah, you pass it over to Shabazz. Oh, perfect. Shabazz, you should have uh, presentation controls. Mm, let me see if I can. Uh, I don't. I must say, I don't really. I'm not a master of this of WebEx, so so there at the bottom a using computer or an iPad. So there in between start video next to start video there should be a share button. Let me make sure uh, you've the share got the stuff. Not, the share button is not active for me. It's just, it's 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 blanked out. Let me just see if I can. It's possible oh. that you you need to like authorize like give WebEx application privileges using a Mac. Yeah, using yeah. a Mac. It could be. It could be. In the past, I've had to, in new installs. They've said, "Oh, you have to like unlock that in your security control panel preference." Oh, I see. Do, do, would you like me to uh, to run the uh, PDF for you? Uh, yeah. I don't want. I don't want everyone to kind of. Bear witness to my incompetence here with computers. So well, it's just yeah. Yeah, WebEx isn't super common. So uh, yeah, if you can do it, I'll tell you when to kind of sure. You know, switch well, through the phone very just, quickly. Everybody here.
Um, okay, my name is Shabazz Stewart. I'm the founder and CEO of Uni. Um, you know, just so the group knows a little bit about my, myself, I come from the most amount of time spent in the public sector, either uh, within or directly adjacent to. I came um, to this work from the Downtown Working Partnership, where I was the deputy director of operations for about four years. Um, and it's my mission to figure out how to scale secure bike parking um, in cities like New York. We just recently announced um, 40 new stations, most of which are in Jersey City. Um, we, we underwent an extensive and thorough um, RFP process with them, which is the tail end of that now. Um, we're also working with the Port Authority, um, with private developers, and with some other government agencies as well. Um, and the idea is that um, we can make bike parking facilities as common um, as bus shelters. Um, next slide, Lucy. Next, oh, great. Um, you know, I think many of you probably know this, but um, if you're thinking about getting to a place in New York where bicycles and scooters, micro mobility, more broadly speaking, occupy, um, you know, 25% of mode share or more, um, we're going to have to tackle bike parking. Um, one in four New Yorkers experience bike theft. Um, that's like an astounding figure. Um, it's one out of every four households. It's 2.7 million people. It's, it's, it's just something that's astounding. Um, and that's not even the full scope of the problem. When you think about, you know, those pictures of Ida where you've got, you know, garbage flowing by, you've got bikes underwater. You think about the blizzard, you know, where you see the handlebars sitting out of the snow drifts. Um, that's what it's like, um, to use a bike in a city. Where are you going to put this thing? And as people gravitate more towards e-bikes um, and more expensive models, that question of where am I going to park this thing on a regular basis that's easy and accessible um, is going to be more common um, and more cogent than ever. Um, I will say that in other cities across the world um, have largely um, realized that this is a problem, more so in Europe and Asia. In London, um, there are 7,500 secure bike parking spaces dispersed across the city. Um, Hamburg has committed recently to 28,000 secure bike parking spaces. Um, New York has 20. Uh, and that's in the Uni and downtown Brooklyn. Uh, next slide. Uh, you guys probably already know this as well. Basically, bikes are more popular than ever. They're the way of the future. Um, scooters as well. Generally speaking, just from a policy standpoint, um, about half of all car trips in New York City are under three miles. So if we're thinking about ways to decongest our streets, and we have this big conversation around the congestion charge, but if we can just get people to stop driving when they're going three miles or less, um, then you know, we'll see half of all traffic congestion go away. That actually helps people who are driving three miles or more. Um, it helps people who from across the street, and it helps reduce emissions. The way that we can do that is transition folks to public transit, but also to micro mobility, bikes and scooters. Next slide. Um, you know, delivery workers, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I know something this board has talked about um, extensively. Um, delivery workers are 80,000 in New York City. Um, they bear the brunt of New York City's um, infrastructure deficit when it comes to bikes and scooters more than any other single group. Right, They're, they die uh, disproportionately uh, on unsafe streets. Um, their bikes get rain and snowed on disproportionately. There's that now infamous picture of uh, our infamous video of the delivery worker biking through uh, stormwater in Ida, but their bikes also get stolen disproportionately. And when they when that happens, um, that's a three thousand, four thousand dollar replacement cost. Um, we have a member um, in Uni. Twenty five percent of our of our membership are um, working cyclists. That's had a bike stolen, um, their bike stolen seven times. Uh, when that happens, they can't work for a month or two months. That means um, for you know, for us, for someone who's as privileged as I am, it's a it's a um, it's an annoyance for a uh, working cyclist who's often making minimum wage or below. Um, it's an existential crisis. It's the a lack of ability to feed your family. It's the inability to send money back home. Next slide. 
Um, we did have a new need in downtown Manhattan. Uh, Lucy and I think is very familiar. Um, Water White Hall Plaza. It launched in 2018. It was the city's first uh, secure bike parking facility um, that was free to use. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, um, I, I don't think we're able to get to a place with BOT um, where the sponsorship and advertising model is committed. So but what we, we do is we work with, with cities to erect infrastructure that is directly or indirectly, I'll get to that in a second, supported by ads and sponsorship. And in the case of DOT, um, we all had an understanding, us in the Alliance for Downtown New York, that that would be permitted. Um, we had sort of a handshake agreement. And when we brought our first sponsor to the table, um, the sort of guidelines became much more vague and a little bit um, harder to understand. We were promised um, more coherent guidelines um, in 2019. We were given interim guidelines that were sort of very difficult to work around. We went to over 500 different sponsors. Um, everyone said that the, the, the guidelines were too onerous and eventually we had to deactivate the station. First thing that was really heartbreaking for me, um, you know, I shook hands of about half the users. We had about 400 people using that station um, who were um, gonna lose, gonna lose you know, what allowed them to get to work in the morning. Um, and you know, it's kind of it almost puts out of business. It, it, it has kind of reshaped our understanding of the barriers that prevent this infrastructure from metastasizing across the city. Um, they're not technical barriers; they're legal. But they're 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 red tape barriers, right? Like we have the ability to, to create infrastructure that works for everybody, but we need to find the political will and the desire um, to actually make it happen. Next slide. Uh, you can see here what that station looked like. Um, you know, this, you know, this is the first secure bike parking facility in New York. It was a risk um, on everyone's part. Um, and, you know, we kind of waited nervously with the Alliance for Downtown New York um, back in October of 2018 for the first call to so start coming in. And like three weeks later, someone ended up calling in and they were like, well, wait, there's only one? <laughs> and so uh, I, I think it, it, it gives a sense it should give the board a sense of um, the latent demand that exists for this kind of infrastructure. If you build it, they will come. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'll talk a bit about how this works. Um, you know, I won't spend too much time on these slides, but you know, it's self-enclosed. It's um, it's it's free to use. Um, we are modular, so we're design agnostic. Um, we have a variety of designs that are appropriate for different kinds of use cases. Um, and sort of our philosophy is designing around the public space, um, integrate placemaking, ambient lighting, other amenities um, inside the core infrastructure, um, and then work with the community um, to figure out what kind of deployments work best um, at certain locations. And that, that menu has been very popular uh, thus far. Next slide. Really quickly, you know, we're transitioning to uh, a new Format and form factor. The new pod is going to be um, sort of a more refined design. The first one, one that we saw in Manhattan, was a prototype. Um, this is going to be uh, hopefully digital um, in terms of the sponsorship. It's going to have the ability to have PSAs and train arrival times and integration, premium materials such as glass, custom padding. Um, next slide. Um, you know, our pilot statistics that we're very excited about. You know, being free to use allows us to basically be open and accessible to all. So um, about 40% of our user base is white, the rest are non-white. That is very similar to where the city is as a whole. Um, in terms of our income base, 27% or so below AMI. Um, we believe it's as high as 40%, but a, a large group of people are not withholding that data from us. They don't want to say you know, how much they make, understandable. Um, but um, you know, most micro-mobility operators, when you look at the scooter uh, landscape, just don't release their user statistics. One operator, I would name them, did, and nationwide, they were 70% black and Latinx, and they were operating in communities that were 60% black and Latinx, right? And so there was an incongruency that was transparent and became available um, or, or, or knowable when we saw what those stats actually were. We're proud of the fact that 
our infrastructure is actually um, available and, and used by all segments of the community, regardless of creed, color, race, or um, wealth. Next slide. Uh, because someone mentioned it in the call, we, we, we quickly stuck this slide in. Um, you know, we're working again, we're designing agnostic. So, how we approach things um, are small density, um, medium density, and high density. So, the curbside um, is a place where there's going to be um, lots of opportunity for secure bike parking, right? There are going to be lots of places in the city where there's no sidewalk space, there's no indoor space to be leveraged. Um, that's true in uh, Brooklyn Heights. That's also true in Lower Manhattan. Um, so the Looney Mini, uh, which lands next week in France, um, is designed to accommodate that that, that small density um, form factor. So uh, each Looney um, each Looney uh, accommodates um, between eight and twenty spaces. You'll see here. This is eight spaces, but you pair them together and get the twenty spaces. Um, and uh, next slide. Um, the other end of the spectrum, um, we're actually working with developers through Euler um, to incorporate high quality, high capacity um, hubs um, as part of the overall build out. And for us, you know, this is something that's been kind of left on the table by the city for years. Developers, as I'm sure this board knows, um, when they go through Euler, are very eager to assemble a CBA. Um, that helps them get through the process. Now, you'll see commonly like parking spaces for shared vehicles, MTA easements, MTA elevators. Um, our idea is, well, why not include high quality Dutch style bike parking? And we've gotten um, four developers across the city to commit to that. Um, in two trees in Totem, two locations in Brooklyn, um, and in Woodside um, in Queens. Um, and so um, it's a model I think can, can really scale in fact, when we look at some yards, when we look at um, the buildings that are either side in the development of, 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 of Grand Central, um, even in the past 10 years, th these are opportunities that have been left on the table, and we're hopeful that we can change the narrative. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, I will say that I, I talked to Lucy, and um, you know, We've we've been, we get asked a lot. Oh, have we tried this agency? Have we tried this, this agency or this these groups of folks? Lower Manhattan is a place where we've actually done a lot of trying. Um, you know, it's sort of a all of the above um, strategy for us. We've we've explored state-owned property in Battery Park City. We've worked very closely with East River Greenway, um, with ADC and, and Parks Department. Um, we've looked at uh, putting minis in the street in partnership with the Alliance in downtown New York and WXY. Um, we've looked at POPs. Um, you know, I'm sad to say, but there's been um, at each one of these scenarios that we've explored um, has experienced a fair amount of red tape. And so our prescription at this point um, is for the city to issue a citywide RFP. Um, this is what Jersey City went ahead and did. It's what other cities in the region are saying they're going to do as well. It's what DOT promised to do in 2019 as part of the Green, the Green Wave plan. But that would allow us to engage in a citywide process, a citywide conversation, and it would be open to everybody, right? It doesn't have to be any, any operator. Um, but I'm happy to walk the group through um, each of these um, each of these avenues we explored. But it's a it's a it's a fairly tortured. <laughs> Because you're trying more of an after you deactivated more of uh, I believe this is the last slide. Next slide. I think it's the end. So uh, that is all I've got. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions. I don't see any hands, so I guess I'm free to speak. Have you ever gone to Brookfield's place? Um, Brookfield Place is in Battery uh, Park City. We we have gone to the Battery Park City Authority. Um, we did not go to Brookfield Place just because we were working directly with the Port Authority and, and, and Battery Park City Authority. But we're open to having that conversation for sure. Okay. The reason I was asking is you go and look at they have two different parking lots, 
that are secured by them. They have large contingents of bicycles that are kept there, all completely un not covered. They like everything to look very beautiful. It seems like the perfect place for them would be to look for some of this nice covered parking. They already have space designated and lots of need. Mm -hmm. I've also had workers at Barry at Brookfield Place who were locking onto temporary fences. And I asked them why they were choosing to do that. And they said, there's nowhere to leave our bicycles. So there is a demand from their own workers looking for a place to leave their bicycles. And they have a large workforce there. Um, yeah, look, what I would like for the group to consider is a letter of support, you know, addressed to City Hall um, that we can that we can share with other stakeholders. Um, that sort of articulates the demand, not not for owning, but for secure bike parking in general, um, with certain, you know, with certain um, models that have been demonstrated to be to, to be efficacious. Um, but we're we're open to talking to all state um, to all stakeholders. I think the challenge that we have um, is that we're a small company. We we have three people, including myself, and. You know, every time we have a conversation and there's a there's a dead end, it's another conversation that we can't have, right? So we try to pick our um, opportunities wisely. We were hopeful that a conversation with the Battery Park City Authority would get us to a place where their stakeholders um, could 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 come on board, and, and that unfortunately hasn't hasn't yet materialized. I'll talk to them. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, Michael? Yeah, I don't have a question, but just wanted to, you know, echo the fact that, uh, yeah, finding secure bike parking is a big, uh, it's like the biggest question mark when you're biking around the city. Um, actually, I do have a question. Uh, is, uh, are most of the, the use of these, these pods, is it for overnight parking or is it um, parking for people trying to get to work and store their bikes um, yeah. while they're in the office? That is a great question. Uh, it's all of the above, right? It's the same as a parking space. So um, we look at this as public transit, and I know you know personal bike bikes are not public transit, but the facilities that allow their usage are, right? And and so um, what we do is we create the space and we make it easy for people to use it for a variety of use cases. So um, the Uni Mini is actually an example where we'll have to, I think. Um, be a little more um, deliberate in how we portion the space, but you know the Uni Mini is going to have two 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 build out scenarios. One for residential streets where it will be overnight parking one to one, and there may be a small fee for the year you reserve a spot, so it's one to one, right? Um, that is going to be certainly a use case for the Uni Mini. There's also going to be a use case for mixed use areas or, or just commercial areas where you're going to work and you have a space, or someone who's delivering food has a space. Um, and it's what we call ad hoc versus uh, versus uh, more of a uh, of a long term high latency parking scenario. But our larger facilities, um, we see all of the above. In, in Water Whitehall, for example, we saw three three use cases overall. We saw one of which we didn't expect. We saw um, people commuting from other parts of the city um, to. Uh, work in lower Manhattan and they would park their bikes during the day, typically from eight to six um, at the uni. We saw residents typically from the building across the street. Is it is it in the at Water Whitehall Plaza is a small street, there's a condominium across the street. Um, and those residents had a bike room, but that bike room was so onerous and cumbersome to use that they preferred to leave their bikes um, inside the uni because it was what we call grab and go. And then a third use case that we didn't anticipate at the onset, but has become um, our most consistent use case um, for working cyclists who park their bike um, overnight between typically 1 a.m. and then on uh, to 6 p.m. the next day or, or 5 p.m. the next day when they would get their bikes and make uh, deliveries. We, I, we had a few workers for Drizzly who, um, you know, 5 p.m. is when people start heading for a drink. Uh, typically, so they would come retrieve their bikes at, at 5 p.m. 
they would typically work until 1.30 a.m. and then they would park their bikes overnight. Um, they live in Bushwick, they live in East New York, and in the middle of the winter, it was such a long way to go. Um, and obviously they're tired from uh, making deliveries all day, so they would take the train home uh, to points beyond and, and park their bike overnight. Got it. Thanks for that. And I'll, I'll also just add that, you know, kudos to you and your team for, um, yeah, keeping it going in the face of, uh, I know you hinted at it, but I'm sure adversity and dealing with bureaucracy and all that. So I'm glad you're, you're chugging along and, uh, these, the, you know, the, the product, the service looks functional and stylish. So that's, that's nice. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, this is a problem that, uh, yeah, I know multiple people have had their bikes stolen, uh, you know, parts of their bikes stolen. So there's definitely a, a need for this, especially in a commuter heavy area and resident, you know, uh, heavy area like lower Manhattan. What problems have well, you had keeping that. them on? Sorry, what problems have you had keeping them on the street? Um, we have, we have had three, you know, we're, these are, these are pilots. So we've had three pilots, including downtown Manhattan. Two are in operation right now, one in Journal Square, one in um, downtown Brooklyn, the Barclays Center. Um, we haven't had any problems. We haven't had any challenges, right? We're working right now. Okay. We're going to, to um, launch, um, you know, hopefully uh, next month, um, and we'll see, you know, how people treat them on the street. But um, part of what I used to do at, at the partnership is help maintain streetscape. So, you know, look in Journal Square, for example, um, there, there there's poor behavior off in the square. There there. Um, you know, feces we have to clean up sometimes. You know, there, 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 there's there are people who you can imagine the usual, you know, behave poorly, right? So um, that's a challenge for us. But um, part of what we do is we take on those responsibilities so that um, the solution is completely turnkey for the public, right? There's literally no excuse not to build more of these. We finance, we design, we build, we maintain, we operate. Um, and if necessary, we deactivate. So um, our job is to um, create an environment where these can thrive um, and bring value to, uh, to New Yorkers. Okay, so if a building wants to install one, because Michael's problem resonates with me, our bike room is a complete mess. There are just so yeah. many bicycles everywhere. If they want to install one just as kind of an overflow area, what are your challenges trying to get them on the street? Um, well, the challenge is all regulatory. I mean, I mean, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but we have two, we have three bids, including, you know, there's a, there's a WXY in downtown Manhattan on near the Wolf building wants to just buy an uni. Um, and, you know, they want to put one in the parking space, but, but currently, um, that's not permitted, right? We've had productive conversations with. Uh, indirectly um, with a number of city council members uh, who've been in conversation with the DOT. The DOT is 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 interested in figuring out a path forward, um, but we don't see, um, at least for the next year, um, a resolution, right? Because there's no permitting process um, that would allow these on the street um, in the space of, of, of a parking space, even when the building is asking for it. Um, and so it's unfortunate that we're not able to even sell these to buildings, right? To put on, on the street, right? The only solution would be these go in an alleyway or a parking or a parking lot. Um, and so what we're hopeful for is is twofold. One is we figure out um, a la carte how to streamline um, secure bike parking infrastructures permitting process throughout the city. There is precedent for that, um, you know, trash cans, the big belly trash cans you have in downtown Manhattan. Um, it's written into the city charter. There's a whole bundle of, 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 of streamlining mechanisms that have been legislated. Um, one of which is, is having sponsorship and advertising on them. It's written into the city charter. Um, but um, we are also hopeful that the city will um, live up to its 2019 um, Green Wave pledge and issue an RFI, an RFP, RFP for a citywide secure bike parking system and follow the steps of Jersey City and hopefully vote both next. Um, and, and therefore, 
usher in a scenario, an operating environment where communities can request um, certain spaces, request, you know, um, curbside installations or, or plaza installations, and that can be granted on a citywide basis. I, I will say that CB4 in Manhattan um, has already written a letter to City Hall saying they wanted secure bike parking. They want, they're okay with advertising um, to pay for it. Um, and that was in 2020. We, didn't, we haven't seen any action. We've worked with um, other community operators to express the DOT and to City Hall a willingness to, um, you know, to, 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 to take some risk. And that hasn't really worked out. I can tell you one particular frustrating um, experience was working with, um, you know, Howard Hughes at, at um, you know, on the Hudson River Greenway. Um, you know, Hudson River Greenway, sorry, the, the East River Greenway under the FDR is a prime example of a space that is underutilized. Um, and, you know, we could have five unis there, right? Um, there's no particular reason that this would not um, be a um, effective use of that space. These are temporary structures. They could, they could go away after a certain period of time. Um, the challenge there, just to give you a sample of the red tape, is that um, even though that property is EDC owned, um, it's administered by Parks Department. And, 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 you know, it's in the city charter, there's no advertising allowed on Parks Department owned property. We did point out that Parks Department theoretically didn't, technically didn't own it. It was EDC owned, but Parks, you know, applied that understanding uh, to that property and refused to back down. Um, now, look, I mean, this is a case where there's an opportunity for executive leadership and be able to say to Parks, well, look, you know, this is something that um, we think even in the pilot fashion is appropriate. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we didn't see the desire from from, from the city, right, to, to step in. And so that's an example where all the stakeholders were aligned, EDC was aligned, the developer was aligned, um, there were multiple sites put forward. This would have been complementary to the ferry, right, um, right, at the multimodal facility. Um, but we still weren't able to cut the red tape to make it happen. Um, and I think that's a good example because the challenges are not lack of space, they're not technical, the challenges are not financial, the challenges are regulatory. And we have to find a way to streamline um, the regulatory environment if we're going to see this kind of infrastructure be cast aside. Thank you for that. And I'm going to have Mimi and then, excuse me, then Mitch. Hey, I had, um, you answered one of my questions um, a long time ago. So, um, uh, let me, um, Try to remember how how is this? Do people use their own bike locks in this space? Is it? I um I might have missed that in the presentation. I was trying to look it up on the website. Um, so, yeah. so like I would come in and lock my own bike. Is there like a? If I was to just leave it there for three months, would it be considered eventually a, an abandoned bicycle? Yeah. Um. That's those are. Both great questions. Um, there are two parts. There are two answers to that. One is what we have now, and one is where we want to get to. So right now, um, it is a self-service, bring your own lock operation. Um, the, the space itself is access controlled, so only credential um, members of the public are able to get in. To be credentialed, we have to register on our website. We do verify through social media um, or through a phone. Oh, I'm sorry, it's really a Zoom interview. That you are who you say you are, um, just because you don't want someone who's coming in um, to steal bikes to sign up and and register, that would be unfortunate. Um, and then we 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 you, you come in and you, your final layer of security is your own lock. The space inside is video monitored. Um, now we are operating on an MVP, a minimally viable product. It's a prototype. It's a pilot. The goal initially for the project was to demonstrate efficacy to show the city, um, to show other cities that this is possible, that it's financially uh, underwritable. Um, we've, we've, we've passed that threshold now. Where we're going to get to in the future is uh, a self locking wrap where um, you'll be able to come in, still access controlled space, 
um, and you'll be able to park your bike um, and uh, the, the apparatus would be um, something that is um, native to the actual asset, right? And so that, that's important for us um, for a couple of reasons, one of which is it will allow us to address your second point, which is overstays. Um, right now, we um, monitor each pod. We do provide insurance to all the bikes inside. So in order to register, um, you have to tell us your make and model, right? You have to kind of um, send us a picture of your bike, et cetera. So we know, we know whose bike generally belongs to who. Um, and uh, if, you, if you stay beyond three days, they're what we call peak times. Then we um, we send you a nice message, or we can um, we can remove your bike and, and put it somewhere. We very rarely have to do that, um, but we have I think twice I've had to put bikes um, and remove them um, when they were in the asset for longer than a month. Um, I think the, our vision of the future is one where um, we remain free to use, but for a period of time. So your first two days would be free. And then after that, we would start to charge you 25 cents an hour, um, not as a revenue generation mechanism for us, but as an inducement to kind of keep it moving. Think of Uni as like a library for, for bike parking, right? It's in our interest collectively to make sure um, spaces um, are, are open and accessible. Otherwise, then it becomes kind of useless. It's the same exact model that, that bike share uses. Thanks, I appreciate that. Good, Mitch. Yes, hi Shabazz. A, a couple hi. of points and a, one, one question. Obviously, there's a definitely need for this. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good idea. Uh, you, you know, except, uh, so first about the city parks, I mean, we're dealing with bureaucracy. I mean, those places that you mentioned, the East River, Greenway and everything, it's it's a it's a win win because you're not taking away parking spaces from the community and it's a, it's a service in in an underserved underserved area. These things usually come down to dollars. Have you ever thought? And and this has happened in the past where, you know, the city or the business wants to take a cut. Have you ever thought of you know like the parks department is so understaffed and underfunded, you know they can't they can't even like like clean bathrooms or or have people like like do anything in most of the neighborhoods. Have you ever thought of maybe in your negotiations with them offering them 10% of your of your revenue or something like that as some type of inducement? Because philosophically, I can't believe they're against the ad ads. They couldn't care less. They're, they're uh, just... No, no, I, I, look, it's a great question. The answer is yes. We actually offer right now, um, we offer 9.45% gross revenue share. And, and we would to, to all our partners. So um, but it, is is there, very, I'm sorry, I continue. No, it's something we're very transparent about. It's a concession for the city. So, so it's, have, it's, they, have they been like, like kind of playing hardball where they think they want a higher percentage or they're not interested at all? They're playing no ball. I, I, <laughs> I mean, look, I, I think if I were to be completely honest with you, I think the challenge we have is that you know, we're a small black and brown owned company in Brooklyn and we don't have a, a big time lobbyist working right. on our behalf. Um, with city government, right? No, I, I think the model that we are we are we are in a moment where all the rational reasons for why this can't work have been exhausted. I've been I I it is to be honest with you um, probably been the most frustrating experience of my life. Um, fifteen percent, you know, like just see if they're totally BS or like if they might go for that. Okay, so that that we was. Would offer, no, but we would we would we have never gotten to have that conversation. Is what I'm saying, okay. like we we would offer. I mean, look at, at higher revenue locations. You, you typically offer a higher revenue share. Um, we we have never gotten to that stage of the business conversation. Okay, we're more yep. than happy. To have a, 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 a conversation about revenue share, about term length, et cetera. Um, but the, the most common answer we get is, um, is, is, is no, this, is, this can't work, this is, this is impossible. Okay. And there's a very limited desire um, from the city writ large right now to take this on. Our experience is. In most cases where we've been successful, either in planning or implementation, there needs to be a champion. Someone needs to decide at the executive level if it's something they want. Um, you know, unfortunately, there isn't someone right now in city government 
that you know is high enough that that can cut through the red tape. Um, so, you know, I'm very realistic about uh, the business side of the conversation. You know, I come from bid. The city wants to make money. We'll give them money. Um, but we just <laughs> okay. We just have not no. been able to have that conversation. I'll get back to okay. One of the two other things. Uh, if the bike, if like the a bike is stolen in your your uh, pod, uh, who's responsible? Uh, we are. I mean, okay. We, it's, it's, we have insurance that covers the bikes inside. We've had to activate that insurance um, at one one moment in our history. Actually, we've done courtesy replacements twice when people didn't lock their bikes, but they and they were taken, you know, in Journal Square. Um, and we had one case where in downtown Brooklyn. Um, someone did come in and um, with a false identity and gain access to space and quickly steal a bike. And we did issue that user um, $2,500 uh, in recompense. Sure. sure. Okay. And then one other thing, and then I'll be, I'll finish. Uh, you know, because of the pandemic and the open restaurants, which has been a, ne a necessity, there's been, and, and I'm just going by the potential spaces in lower Manhattan. I'm just speaking about that, not about the South Bronx or Brooklyn or whatever. That there's been whole blocks, half blocks, blocks where they've had been removing of, of like metered parking or, or any parking at night, you know, because uh, during the day you can't park anywhere around here. So the, I could see that there would be some resistance on the minis on the street from, from different sectors where other, where those same sectors would be totally supportive of the first three things that you have. You know, because it, it's 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 just a plus. It's not taking away from anything. So, especially because of the open restaurants, where there's already like a big percentage of the streets closed off for for for, for any available like spaces. You know, I I would just personally uh, to have less resistance from different groups. I would not focus on that. You know, and focus on the other things because. To me, the other three things are non-controversial at all. Uh, the other, the other, the larger yeah, assets. Park are City, things. East River Greenway, Pops, and things like that. And like I said, yeah. the, the minis on the street, you're already having like half half of streets or whole streets with, with, with the spaces removed because of the, the pandemic open restaurants, which is a necessity for the businesses right. to, to not to fold. So on top right. of that, it seems that right. at least... Uh, Point in time, it might be too much. That little thing might be too much. I understand. I understand. You know, un unfortunately, um, look. I mean, we're open to all of the above, and we kind of you know go where we're told, right? Um, and we're just trying to find open space that can be leveraged for this purpose. And there's a lot of it in, in downtown Manhattan. Downtown Manhattan is not the raft of open space. Um, and like, for example, you know, in Battery Park City, lots of open space. You know, I in, in, in 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 down the greenway, lots of open space. Um, that's that's not that's unactivated, right? And in some cases, that doesn't look too good. Um, but there has to be a, a a desire from the city and the permitting authorities um, to go through the process to allow us to leverage their open space, right? It, it, I'll give you an example. If we say we're going to pay for an uni, we're going to put in a hundred thousand dollars to build a 30 space duty. And the city says, okay, okay, you can you can put ads on it, but only for a year. That that's financially unworkable, right? Like you you need to, you need to have a certain term in place to earn your money back. You know, there are the realities that exist around how this can work. Um, but we haven't even gotten that feedback, right? We haven't even gotten a one year only feedback. We've gotten that, you know, for whatever reason, all of these spaces that we're seeing on the street they have different masters, they have different owners, um, and it's either a lack of desire, a lack of interest, or you might find someone who wants to move forward, but there's a legal reason, there's a lawyer saying no, there's someone that's like, no, we can't do this now. Maybe in three years we can do it, but not now. Um, that's and, not my point. My point is because of the pandemic, there's had to be a reduction of street spaces so that the restaurants could have open streets, which is so I'm, I'm just saying at this point in time, I'm not talking about legal or moral. I'm saying that as a fact, the restaurants have had to take up blocks and uh, right. have blocks, of blocks at a time. And so that's why I would like kind of be against that right now while I support everything else that you're doing. 
if, if, if I'll, I'll take it, Michael and Mitchell, sorry, Mitchell, I'll take it. If you support 80% of what we're doing, you no, know, look, we can meet the demands of, of lower Manhattan with larger facilities on, on public space. Um, I think there's plenty of room, but the desire has to be there. We don't need to take more parking space. I mean, look, we, we pioneered this flexible model just for that feedback where someone might say, I love what you're doing, but I don't want to give up parking spaces. Well, we've got other, you know, we've got other scenarios as well, right? Um, what we what we prefer to do is to work with bodies such as this to figure out a siting plan and a placement plan and figure out what's workable. And then, you know, then we we, we implement. Uh, so we're just looking for a way in at this point. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can get there. Hopefully the next administration can get us there. Thank you. And Lucian, did you have a comment to make? Um, no, I, I just would say that um, I think Jennifer Leung is going to sign off soon. So if there's any questions you have for her as part of this conversation, you should probably ask those now before she signs off. But um, well, I would be interested in eventually. I won't put her on the spot today. I, I would be very interested in hearing the DOT's position on yeah. what we can do to get some on the street. Because off the street isn't the jurisdiction. Private space is private space. Yep. So no, any information I, I, there would be I'll helpful. I'll say that, um, you know, when UNI had their, their, um, their pod in Whitehall, um, Anthony Nataro was very supportive. Um, you know, he wanted us to at least try to do what we could to make sure that the speaker's office was liaising well with DOT and and um, we were both um, sad to see it go. But we certainly, I'm sure there's lots of different jurisdictions and uh, even within the city of New York, um, uh, not, not to mention state and uh, bi-state authorities that, that are out there. So Lower Manhattan certainly has a a menu of, of options, but um, I think there, you know, Shabazz is right. There needs to be more, more general um, desire by the city to to make it happen because it's there if it need if if they want it. Yeah, no, I agree. I will be in touch. You know what I will do is, and you've probably noticed if you've looked at the agenda, Shabazz, that we have a lot of of resolutions being done based on prior contacts get some time to put things together. I'd like to look into some of these groups like the BPC Authority and, and Brookfield because they're so close to me, but also some of the jurisdictions and talk to CB4 about their letter and get an idea of some of the feedback that I can get from these various sources. Because I think you're right, it's going to be a regulation. It's just a matter which regulations to go after and how. And new administration is going to be critical because people know they're leaving and others are coming in. I would be grateful um, for any um, any help you could provide and any uh, assistance you could lend. Um, I think, look, I, I think we, we, we are a private company, but we view ourselves as creating public transit. And I think the time for this has come not now, but a decade ago. And anything can be can you afford, we're, we're, we're ready. Yes, well, so I, I greatly thank you for this, and I would like to move ahead, so I'm sure we'll be in touch. Lucian knows how to contact you and see what we can do. Thank you so much, Betty, and thank you to the whole thank board. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, guys. Well, that, that's, yeah, that time has passed. It's more than overdue. So we'll look into it, but run up to the next slide. Let's see what's next. Sure. Lucian, you mind handing me back those privileges? I uh, got it. <laughs> All right, let me put this up. So next I've got Center in Lafayette. Yes, and they're doing a resolution for this. Again, everybody knows these lanes are going in. That's not the issue, and nobody's, I'm not questioning that, so I hope no one else is questioning that. Uh, but with the Brooklyn Bridge and some others, I thought, do we really want to go on the record with some of the things that we want to make sure are done? 
And so unless there's a lot of pushback, I'd like to have you take a look at some therefore be it resolved to resolution based on the things that were said when it was first introduced to us and things that have been said since. For those of you who weren't for the full presentation, I'm talking about only the Center Street and Lafayette Street, which would be the northern connection between the Brooklyn Bridge and up to our neighbors in CB3. As you can see, this diagram crosses the line of Canal Street into CB3, and I'm not talking about their part, I'm talking about just our part. I'm going to follow Tammy, and I'm not going to step on their toes and what they say in their district. Next one. So that's the location and the general scenario, because it changes in different segments. But the basic idea of what is called protected in this program is a bike lane that is next to a curb, one side or the other. There is then a striped area followed by a parking area. As I've said before, the striped area plus the parking, plus the bicycle area is wide enough to allow emergency vehicles through. So when things are really chock-a-block through the city center area, this is how fire trucks and things can get through. Cyclists are clearly quite mobile and can let something moving quickly get by. Next. So is there any real pushback to doing a resolution? And then we can talk about the specifics of this one. Eric, if you'd like to speak. Yes, hi. I, I, I was I, I was part of the DOT presentation. Um, I have real concerns over their plan on Center Street to make it only one lane, one travel lane. I, I think that's unrealistic considering that you have three courthouses there. Um, you know, with a courthouse, you have, you know, you know, many people, you know, maybe some famous people, you know, you know, they'll, they'll block the traffic. Um, you know, uh, you have a lot of corrections officers, NYPD. It's not realistic to have only one lane of traffic. If there is ever a, uh, an obstruction accidental or intended at, you know, for a VIP, that's, that's the only way to go northbound. I mean, the other way, all the way east is, is Mulberry and then you have Bower, Bowery, but to the north, I think it's church, but you'll, you're really, you're really restricting the flow of traffic. Yes, the emergency Cars. vehicle. Car, cars, yes, cars, thank you. Yes, yeah, so you're saying no bicycles. They shouldn't be allowed or they should be killed. I think I support a bike lane. I just don't think they have to find a way to have two lanes of traffic, not one, not for a major, not, not for a road like Center Street. They found the parking and that's why they brought up the parking was something they couldn't remove because placard abuse is so horrible up there anyway. They're gonna have enough time taming them and put a lot of effort into maintaining parking spaces in that region, which is another big concern. So it's just a one lane of traffic, it's one travel lane is not realistic. That's my reason for not, not, for not thinking this is a, a, a plausible idea, because in, in, in the long term, it just takes, you know, one obstruction and, and you'll have, uh, you know, you won't have through traffic and, and there's the other northbound roads are, are, are far away. Okay, so I will give it to Michael. Sure, sorry, I just got to unmute myself. Um, yeah, no, I hear what Eric says uh, that the center street is uh, uh, often um, obstructed and uh, as someone who's, um, you know, gone out there pretty frequently, I would say it's it's usually only one traffic lane because of the amount of um, uh, double parking that there is anyway. So I'm wondering if there's a possibility that some like these, it's these infrastructure improvements for cyclists might actually help um, alleviate other issues with that. Um, especially if uh, the, the bike lane plus the curb gives emergency vehicles, um, like a, a potential like um, alleyway, should it be obstructed um, or Maybe we could add into our resolution asking um, DOT to, to, you know, take, you know, and I think they have, um, but, you know, take special account of the fact that there's a lot of double parking 
um, and placard abuse in that area. Um, but uh, yeah, that said, I don't have a, a strong objection to to putting a, a resolution out there in favor of um, some of these improvements. Yeah, I think that was that was the issue that even the DOT brought up is that placard parking is yeah, I think the did, biggest yeah. issue through there. So by adding another travel lane, all you could letting is more placard. They're hoping to tame it down a bit and balance the uses. But yes, there are a lot of there have always been questions through that area. Correct, Lucian? Challenging him. Anyway, the point is the engineers have come up with this design and it is being installed. So that's not really in question. Um, I wanted to speak to that if, if um, you're. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm on Center Street every day and it is only ever one traffic lane because of all the double and triple parking. So it is functioning as a single lane traffic lane right now or anyway. And like Michael said, this, this would organize the street better and then there would be the 11 feet of the protected bike lane and the buffer to use if emergency vehicles needed to so it would actually be a much better situation than what's there right now because it is only ever one lane because of all the parking yeah that's what the engineers came up with with the allowed two a, lanes, one would just be, it would just be filled with the same parking. It would be down to, even if there were two, it would be down to one lane like it is. So it's, it's better to have the design that they've come up with and are going forward with. You know what, I'll let me have Mitch speak and then Eric, you can speak again. Can you go back one slide? I, I'm, I'm not uh, gonna uh, opine on that, yeah. Okay, the, the, where it says maintains two travel lanes for vehicles. So I'm just gonna focus on Grand Street, just between, this is where I'm confused. Maybe one of you guys can help well, me. Well, this is, this is just Lafayette Street between Kenmar and North Street. Well, it says protect curb connect spring. And oh, so it's not, it's not on Grand, because remember they try to do so, like Grand Street between the Bowery and Christie where there's some, you know, I, I just, there's some good, uh, vegetable fruit and and fish like like uh, uh, in that part of chinatown uh for shopping and there's only uh, like one through traffic lane because of uh you know there's there's cars on both sides and i think that they tried to put a bike lane a few years ago i'm not sure if it's still there or not but uh are we, are we not talking about that part of grand street now, if you look up into the upper left this is okay. the diagram from the dot okay well uh, then you and thank you betty I thought we're just talking about Center Street and Lafayette from basically from Worth to Canal. Okay, then I was I was uh, focusing on the wrong street. Thank you. Well, actually, it, it's all of it for the resolution, but it is only up to Canal that we're talking about. Uh, the way they showed the picture went into CB3, so I, I couldn't. It did represent some of our district. The picture would be the same. But I stole it from the DOT, sorry. Uh, and Eric? Yes, um, the, so the current situation where, where you have double parkers on, on a, a double parkers on center, that proves that, that, that they use it at, you know, that, that they will use, continue the double park or at least make prolonged stops um, dur on that street, especially when, when they have court, you know, when court is in session. You're a and defeatist. <laughs> it's, Actually, and, the, P, the, the NYPD, uh, which is the fifth precinct for this particular route, uh, was out there and they were putting signs up on cars, telling them that the enforcement was starting. Um, you know, they they enforce it, so I, I don't know how how you know on their own. I, I don't know how thorough they'll be on that throughout the long term. So, well, I'll say none of us do, but it was interesting that they even started posting things on cars. So, Betty, I thought you he's... said that they defunded that, like those type of uh, services. You know, we, you know that. No, this we... was simply an enforcement of double parking. Okay, okay. Which Betty happened to be placards, but that isn't why they were going after them. 
Sorry to interrupt, but I do see that Patrick, you just put your hand up. Yes. Yeah, I just want to say, I just wanted to comment on the one lane issue that, that there's a lot, there are a lot of examples around our community district and certainly throughout Manhattan where the city has done this. And basically you're just managing the traffic and the parking and the different uses of the, of the lane. And when you get down to one travel lane, it actually works as counterintuitive as it may sound, Eric, the, the people don't stop in that one travel lane. They continue on, they may get frustrated, but they move along. Um, and I would encourage the DOT to um, cite some examples of that around community district one and around Manhattan where that works uh, because it does. Uh, this is a section that has three courthouses. I, I'm just, I'm saying that there's a lot of people coming in and out, you know, to if they, totally understand. Yeah. And if they're, if they're allocating two to parking or whatever that space may be to parking and, and just more or less, um, more or less designing it as to the existing conditions of what's going on right now. Again, I know it seems and sounds counterintuitive, but it really does work. And you don't see people stopping in that one travel lane. They, they figure out how to stop in those other two pieces of, of real estate that have been allocated for that. But again, I mean, to your point, it's a, it's a realistic concern for people to have. And I, I think that it would behoove the DOT to put out um, some examples of where this actually works in other parts of the city and in our community district. Yes, so I know where is this with their fear being resolved and it is within the context of this is being built. So what could get rid of the first line to install a protected bike lanes uh, because we have so many complaints from cyclists that it is so dangerous to just drive among the vehicles. I don't know how much pushback there is to giving them some space, especially with congestion pricing potentially in the future. And it's heavy mass transit in this area. So people don't have to drive. But I know they do, but they don't have to. Uh, also to monitor the bicycle and micro transport usage you know, within those lanes, as well as the injuries due to congestion to determine if the space and the bike lane is adequate and safe. If you're gonna make it, it might as well at least be looked at. Uh, keep the bike lanes safe and available during the demolition of the current and construction of the new Manhattan Borough Detention Center on White Street. That will be a challenge coming up uh, unless things get changed. And include accommodations for people with visual and or mobility impairments in all of the pedestrian and bike safety improvements. Remember, this is not just a bicycle uh, project. It is about pedestrian safety as well. So I'd like them to include consideration of at least the mobility and the visually impaired. Any comments about these specifically? If not, Mitchell, I assume your hand's not up, it's still up. Oh, sorry, buddy, it, it might be me. I, I just need to run to the restroom for a second and I know I'm manning the controls here, so I just wanted to let you know. So that's the reason why it's uh, uh, not uh, not moving, but uh, I'm- If you, if you have something to guys. say, by all means, say it. Okay, then go to the next one. Uh, asking the police department, which is the fifth precinct, to strongly strongly urge to ticket and tow any vehicles that block any portion of Center Street or Lafayette Street bike lanes. Because again, are they going to take over? They're not likely to take over the moving lane. They're likely to take over the bike lanes, which again will make it dysfunctional. Betty, aren't, are allow people, aren't, to vehicles. aren't people allowed to? pick up and drop off like anywhere, whether it's a bike lane or a fire hydrant or a bus stop, like to pick up and drop off. I mean, cause you know, cause when you say any portion, of course, I, I agree with you, but aren't, aren't like, you know, there are things that happen where you have to drop off somebody or somebody has to be picked up. Is, is that uh, unacceptable also to, uh, I mean, or is that, is that, a, 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 you know, like, uh, okay. I'd have to look at the signage along the street because it's dependent on the signs on the street. But even the signage, even when it says no stopping, no parking, aren't you because I like aren't you allowed to just pick up and drop off? I have an answer to that question, Mitch, in a minute. Because I can <laughs> remember the exact details, but I have the DOT statement about that. 
I just hate when everything, I don't hate, I just don't, don't like when something is just like totally like, you know, never be, because there's always situations that come up, whether it's for a bicyclist, a car, a pedestrian, you know, where, you know, things happen where there has to be some type of, you know, common sense. As yeah, no, there, there are some, and in fact, there are buses, so there are bus stops. Uh, if you go to the next one, and I'll get to the answer of your question, Mitch, because I, like I said, I copied and pasted it. So besides that, the NYPD, the next one. Then you're going to wait for Michael to come back. Because okay, I wish I could remember the signs. You see, hold on. Me, me, um, you sent them to me. I'm going to pull them up. Okay, if we have further resolved, ask the mayor. Sorry, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, asking the mayor to promote Vision Zero with a need to reduce speed by supporting the construction of the bike lanes, insisting that tickets be ticketed. So, again, backing up the previous requests uh, and ensuring that the Department of Sanitation de ice <laughs> and removes snow and debris as a priority, the same as the vehicle lanes in the bike lane. Again, that's been a problem. If you remember last winter, there was up to a week on some bike lanes where they were completely unusable, which was a waste because cars couldn't use it, bikes couldn't, I mean, nobody, it was unusable space. Next one, which I hope is the end. Okay, ask the city and the elected officials, current and newly elected, to make biking a safe, sustainable, low court low cost transportation option in anticipation. So these are state laws now, the central business district tolling, which is a state law, and to help achieve the goals of New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, where we have to meet carbon emission levels that are gonna be declining pretty steeply, pretty quickly, which is going to affect all vehicles, unless they're electric. And next, just to make sure it doesn't have Mitch's answer. No, Mitch, you'll have to wait. Oh, it's okay. I just was. was I know it's was, coming uh, up because it is, but it but it is confusing to people. I just wasn't comfortable with saying like you know if it's anything is blocking at any time you want them to be towed. I mean, I'm saying like of course I don't want some car blocking the bike lane for like you know parking there, but you know if somebody's you know if something a situation comes up where somebody has to pull over for a second or have somebody has to drop somebody off where I've seen things happen like that. And then all of a sudden a, a cop car comes and, you know, it's like that, that instant ticket, yeah. you know, so I, I just don't like it to be so like, you know, crazy, uh, you know, like inflexible, even though the principle I agree with. Yeah. And like I said, it's mostly the signs that make a difference. No, but uh, I'm talking about what, what, voting what on the resolution because this is a DOT plan for the bike lanes that are going in. What one one um, one suggestion could be yes. that you know DOT installs signage asking for drop offs to be made on Worth Street because all uh, people have to do is take the right on Worth. <laughs> you know, there there are people that that for whatever reason, if 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 Betty's in my car. I'm going to drop her off in front of where she has to go and and assuming she doesn't have an electric uh, a scooter, you know, like there's so many reasons why people have to drop people off in front of some place. You know, I, I agree with it in principle, but like for, for it to be like totally inflexible, there are just situations that come up that people have to be understanding. Sometimes a car has to wait, sometimes a pedestrian has to wait, sometimes a bicyclist has to wait just because of a human situation. Mitch, most of a parking protected bike lane, I, I think the situation you're describing wouldn't come up. Okay. You know, because people would, they could, they could pull over in the floating parking, or they could even pull over in the sort of the those striped areas at the front or end of each block. You know, but to actually drive next to the curb in between the cars and the floating parking, that would be very. That would be very odd and, and very awkward, I think, even for the driver. So I, I, unfortunately, I've, I've yeah. seen it a few times, like in, in like around around 
where I live, where somebody had to drop somebody off. It, it was like it was a protected bike lane, but you know they didn't want to drop them off. Like there, there was, there were placard cars in the in the parking spots next to the protected. Right, bike. right. The off, they, right. They didn't, so to, they didn't want to let. They didn't want to drop them off in in like with traffic coming on. So they just pulled over for a second because otherwise they're dropping them off like a, a, a family with small children or an elderly person or somebody that had crutches and they, they didn't want to drop them off in, in where the next lane is, is passing. You know, I mean, things come up in all in, in everybody's for that living. same reason, the danger of yeah. those those cars. That's why the bikes don't want to be forced out of their lane for that same reason, you know, as well, so for as once, why you're saying someone wouldn't want to disembark in a vehicle lane. That's also why bikes don't want to be pushed out. Well, of and, I agree, lane into that. and I mostly agree, but I'm saying that sometimes like sometimes I'll, I have to wait if I'm, you know, going somewhere, walking somewhere and there's somebody that's that's a uh, Disabled, and I, I don't. I'm not going to push them down the stairs when I go into the train. I'm, I'm going to. I'll wait two minutes. And so, if a situation like that, then let, let the bicyclist wait 30 seconds. Just like I would want a car to wait for somebody else. I mean, things can't be so rigid. There has to be some type of of of, of compassion for different situations. Well, I think there probably will be, but the fact is also the bicycles are on just one side of the street. Okay. So it's the same issue with cars on the other side of the street. Um, Betty, I'm just trying to throw ideas out for the, the committee to discuss and consider. Um, would a, a no standing zone, a delineated no standing zone on the court side um, kind of create space for drop offs and pickups? You know, like a kind of a kiss and, uh, was it kiss and ride uh, kind of effect? For, for for people, as, or as, you know, I just want to kind of put that as, out there as a a non placard uh, allowed curbside reg. So I'd have to go look at the whole length of it to see, but I think Mitch's point is he wants to be able to stop at any point. So you would need signage continuously. So I don't know if it can be dealt with in this particular resolution. Ariyama? I just wanted Mitch to know that he's not alone. I, I don't always say anything because it, it really becomes exhausting for me um, sometimes in some of these conversations to 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 comment. But um, you know, there's a, there's these are poor people, a lot of these people that have been waiting. To, for access to Center Street because of the construction that Worth Street was under for two years. They finally get the street back and now this. And they, they were already complaining before about you know, their businesses were struggling and things because of the Worth Street construction. And then now we're right back at it. You know, there are and there are other poor people that are trying to get to those courthouses. And yes, they do like to be uh, need to be dropped off in some cases. Um, you know, people that are um, pending eviction and they got to go down to that housing court and, and being sued by their credit card company. They got to go down to that civil court and they're getting dropped off there. And then Manhattan Detention Center is there. People are getting picked up and dropped off in the jail. So it's just like, I don't know. There's, I guess there's no way to please everybody, but I just wanted to know, wanted Mitch to know that he's not the only one that thinks about those other things. Um, you know, I do too. I do, I'm just, I just get tired of raising my hand or speaking out or doing things sometimes. And yeah, no, I appreciate that people are, do have to stop, but they're also, like I said, there are bus stops and things along the way as well. So there has to be something accommodating, but as far as specifics. They try to make space for a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. I'm sorry, Betty, I didn't hear you. They're trying to make space for different people to come by different modes. Right, and, and we, we agree. I'm just, it's like, if a bicyclist has to wait 20 seconds, you know, and uh, for something because somebody less fortunate than them is is having to be like let off somewhere, you know, it's okay. If I have to stop from from because somebody less fortunate than me is is walking slower than me going to the train, then that's okay. You know, it's it's there has to be not so much inflexibility, like. Uh, that's all I'm saying, I, and I'm, I'm not against the bike lane, but I, but there, there needs to be a little more, you know, uh, flexibility. 
but without the, so, you know, anyway, thank you, Marianne, and thank you, Betty. Yeah, well, thank you. So, again, that's that's a constant struggle, isn't it, in the city? But nevertheless, for a vote on the resolution as stated, um, solution, I'm not going to put in something for a turn off because, again, that doesn't seem to deal with what most people are concerned about. And I'm also not sure that doesn't exist. Okay, just put it out there for, for, for thought. Yeah, yeah no, and it may be thought. something we end I'm up coming back open to. Open to considering that in the future. Um, I'm yeah. sorry, I interrupted Betty. No, I was saying exactly the same thing. So let's Anyways, take a vote if, on this while we still have quorum. Yeah, if you did call the question, I, I'm happy to second. I call it for a vote. Let me just uh, double check that we have the same members here. Give me a second. Um, great. Okay. Um, so we'll go with uh, any opposed. Um, I oppose. Eric, I have Eric. You opposed. Any other votes in opposition? I'll any abstain. I'm a little conflicted on a few things. While I, I'm happy about most of it, but I'll, I'll have to abstain, Lucian. Okay. A any other abstentions? Any recusals? Okay, the motion carries. Okay, great. Can't believe we got through two resolutions in the same meeting. So I'm going to push you for a third one, which in fact, for those of you who've been on the committee for a while, we'll see it looks a lot like ones they've seen before. And this is going after a change for the loading zone parking rule changes. And again, after we've talked about Titus School, this should also be reminded to you that people with placards can park in loading zones, both commercial loading zones and neighborhood loading zones. We in the first district cannot get uh, neighborhood loading zones yet. They did just open up to CB2 to start being able to ask for them so that people in buildings can have a drop off place along the street, very much like Mitch was just talking about. But unfortunately, since placards can park in loading zones right now without a rule change, uh, loading zones are virtually useless down here in the first district. So I'd like to kind of make them potentially more useful for what they're meant for. So I start with some of the whereas statements just to remind you because we've been through this so many times. Uh, we as a district are home to many high rise residences and business buildings, historic districts with narrow streets and sidewalks, as well as city government and city agencies uh, with city owned vehicles and employees with city issued placards. So this is going to take on city owned vehicles as well as city issued placards. Second one, the growth of the Internet shopping. You remember this came up in the New York Times, not you well, I guess several months ago now. The growth of internet shopping, grocery deliveries, and use of taxis and for hire vehicles have dramatically increased the demand for curb access. Besides schools like Titus School, most of us can't get access to a curb no matter what. Third, the pandemic accelerated the change in how people live and shop. So the number of deliveries to residences now exceed the number of deliveries to office buildings. And this has continued, which has expanded the need for loading zones in areas like ours that have a lot of residences. Next one. So we can go through some of the other whereases. Uh, the New York Times reported that a single Manhattan condominium gets about 100 packages delivered throughout the day. I laughed at that. But in one 211 unit residential building, and I'll be honest, it's mine, um, I kept after my doorman to keep count of things for me, and they have it on a data system. But we receive 100 packages a day from just FedEx, another 100 a day from United Parcel, and a myriad of items from other delivery services. I can tell you that two days ago, my building got 160 packages from Amazon alone. 
Second, in addition to a typical deliveries, residential buildings in our district are getting deliveries throughout the day and the evening, seven days a week. Kept track of this, including moves, furniture deliveries, groceries, florists, bakeries, liquor stores, meal deliveries like Uber Eats or Seamless, uh, newspapers, messenger services, school buses, taxis, other passenger drop-offs and pickups. Among so there are a lot of of use that people want access to the curb. Next. So to remind you to United Parcel Service, which many of us like to complain about, and the post office also, but they officially testified at a city hearing that their drivers cannot find legal parking, probably because of placards, because of the lack of available curbside space, especially in Manhattan, where there's not enough loading zones. New York City's DOT's neighborhood loading zones program was created to respond to the shift in residential deliveries. And in fact, a lot of complaints come through the quality of life committee about this uh, and has helped to reduce double parking, have the neighborhood loading zones. They keep the bus and bike lanes clear by providing space for active loading and unloading for personal for hire and commercial vehicles. But we can't have them down here yet in our district. 2008, a study was actually done in our district and they concluded that vehicles with city issued placards take space away from designated spaces like curb space for commercial vehicles. In fact, 22% of all loading area zone spaces were occupied by vehicles with city issued placards. And that was back in 2008. Since then, in 2017, New York City gave 50,000 new placards out to the Department of Education, bringing the citywide estimate of placards, not city vehicles, which has also increased, but just city placards to 160,500 are in circulation, according to the City of New York. Next one. Drive you crazy, Michael. So for those who like rules, New York City Administrative Code, give you the number, specifies that it is permissible to use a city issued parking permit or placard in truck loading and unloading zones. Even though growth of freight and deliveries demands loading zone space be protected, we have a growing number of placards who can legally use them. City owned vehicles disproportionately park in, in our district because we're home to city government. And their number has greatly increased since Mayor de Blasio took office and has continued to be a bigger problem certainly than it was in 2008. There is an administrative code, give you the number, it states that no vehicle operated on behalf of the city, so a city owned vehicle, shall obstruct a bicycle lane, a bus lane, when the restrictions are in effect, sidewalk, crosswalk, or fire hydrant. Uh, and while these locations are important, and they are, one would think that freight zones are also important to keep the city moving, which is one of the main goals of the DOT. So we'd like to protect them. We go to the next and move to the okay so therefore be it resolved we've done this before and i know tammy has been after me to i promised i'd specifically go after city vehicles and placards but anyway we implore the dot uh, to change the new york traffic rules and parking rules so that parking with a city issued placard is prohibited in commercial and neighborhood loading zones that means amending 19-162.3 to exclude in truck loading and unloading zones. So don't allow it. Then we have to go in the other direction and amend that same uh, rule to make it illegal for them to park in freight zones. And then amend 19-162.5, another number, to include loading zones 
commercial, truck, and neighborhood zones. So they can't be obstructed by a city-owned vehicle. So again, I had to go to different rules for different kinds of vehicles and traverse the rule completely. Uh, next one. Oh, and then to ask that please neighborhood loading zone programs be brought down to our district. And they would be viable if we could control the placard parking. So general comments. That's the million dollar question, Betty. I mean, everything here is perfect if it could be enforceable. <laughs> well, if you don't change the rules so it's against the law, even if you had a gung-ho mayor, we'd be stuck. Sure. I mean, it's this seems like a no-brainer, but uh, <laughs> it's almost like, you know, with, without the, the any enforcement of the placard thing, it's, it's uh, we, 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 we could be blue in the face, but. I, you are completely correct. This is trying to dot the I's and cross the T's so that right. if enforcement and a mayor come on board, sure. at least we have the law to back us up. Right yeah. now, we do not. Sure. So if you go to the next one, just to make sure I'm done. Oh, this is for you, Mitch. <laughs> I put it in here. And in fact, for those who are wondering, it does vary from no stopping to no standing to no parking. Uh, and in fact, I can tell you, I, there's a no standing in front of my building. And a man came by with his car and his wife and two children got out with one suitcase. I mean, they just had a small one in their hands. They carried out a policeman who never enforced anything in Battery Park City came out and ticketed him in front yeah. of me. He had to fill, fix his quota for the for that week. I mean, it's it's sad, you know. There has I to you know, there, there needs to be a human element where you know you, of course, you could you have to picture yourself in that situation also, you know. And I don't mean you personally. I mean in in general. And yes, no, I know. But so we're looking at some of these other loading zones would allow you to take merchandise out, uh, and be a little bit more. If you in if you were in one of our cars, Betty, and you had one of like a, a, a inferior mobile uh, 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 device uh, that that was that was you know you had to like wheel yourself it would be cruel to ask you to get off to drop you off at the corner when and then for you you know what i'm saying it's it's there are situations that come up right so this is one way of opening up some curb space to those sure. in residential buildings as well as commercial and schools by limiting the placards and where they're allowed to, to park because some of DOT's curbside management has gone to naught because of placards. So anyway, I would like to move to vote on this. Unless Michael, you'd like to speak first, please. Oh, I was just gonna, I was basically gonna echo what, what Mitch said. Um, yeah, this is, thanks for doing the research and putting this together, Betty, because it's, uh -huh. it's in line with, I think we've talked about this at several meetings over the past few months. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I agree with you, it's part of our, like, you know, we need to change parking regulations and go after enforcement, but like, we need to at least make sure that the parking regulations are happening. Cause, uh, yeah, I mean, if, um, uh, you know, the FedEx trucks are going to make their deliveries, um, whether or not they can find parking and that's what's happening right now. So they frequently are just parked in the middle of the street. So let's get them their spots. <laughs> at least you can do is try. Yep, exactly. So, so yeah, I'm in favor of it. Yep. He's like and, the uh, second. Happy to second. Yep. And Lucian, I turn it over to you. Okie dokie. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to ask for opposition abs uh, abstentions and recusals. Anyone in opposition to this motion? Anyone abstaining? Anyone at, uh, asking to recuse himself from this vote? Hearing none. Assume that all are in favor and the motion carries. Hat trick, Betty. <laughs> yes, well, I say thank you everyone for staying long enough to get through three resolutions because these have been holding up for months now, since June. So nice to move forward with them. And I'll start working on Shabazz's next. But any comments about the district budget, which is the last issue? Uh, to remind people who've been on for a while, Nothing that I'm aware of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lucian, has been cut from last year's budget. 
That's correct, Betty. Um, what Michael, was the gonna site? The... I was going to pull up the site for you, Lucian. What was it again? Oh. Yeah, it's budget.mcb1.nyc. Dot NYC. But if you want to take controls, feel free to. I don't know. It'd, it'd be better if you ran it so people can. So it takes a second to load the uh, to pull the information from the air table into that first window. But what we're going to ask you to do is to um, to filter. There's a button at the top called filter. Yep. And add a condition and where uh, agency is DOT. You got it. So we have a couple of them here. Um, I'm, I, I asked Jennifer, and she, this is something that she needs to do to help us between this committee meeting and executive, but um, both CB1's district manager, that's myself, and CB2's district manager, that's Bob Gormley, have asked DOT independently of which is the, the preferred way for them to receive information about cobblestone reconstruction. Do they want them all together as one request or do they want each street to have its own request? And well, or can we group them by neighborhood? Well, you know, what, how, how do they want this info? Because I've, I've been critiqued both ways and, <laughs> and we just want to know how, how do they want this served to them? What kind of platter should we put it on? And I'll do whatever they want. Um, so I think Bob and I are both kind of at, at wit's end at this point. So that those, you know, I'm gonna ask for you all to kind of leave those because I have to do whatever DOT says they want. Um, but you know, we, we did get some information about the, uh, the big study. That was the large item for CB1. Um, and there's a lot of money uh, for that study. Um, but I think Betty identified one item that needs to be removed. Betty, I can't remember off the top of my head. What was it? One is for the school. Oh, Rose, the one, uh, one Rose Island Island Street. Access. One, yes, is the bicycle on. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge pedestrian area because right. the bike lanes That's are right. now open. Yeah, and, and the Governor's Island access year round is another one that has right. to come off. Um, but otherwise, all of our other items stand. Um, it also depends on what your definition of the Tribeca World Trade Center bike path is. World Trade Center did add some bike stamps to the protected portion of the Church Street uh, corridor. They're offset kind of uh, internal portion of Church Street, which kind of creates um, a, super, a super protected bike lane effectively. Um, but I think that's the extent of what they're going to do at this point. That's what they said. And some of the stuff has been turned down in the past because it's really port authority control, not city yeah. budget. Right. And, and and so I think that for things that have been turned down um, and we may need, need to take a different approach, I would recommend removal. I would too. Yeah. We'd be better off to try a resolution or something and go after the agency that actually has authority. Yeah. Well, same thing with the accessible signals. Uh, they keep asking for only when you have a specific location. Does anyone have any questions for some of these items? Michael, could you scroll down a little bit on the um, the Airtable list? Yes, and meet me your bathrooms in there. Yep, that's that, that's been added. So we'll 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 bring that up at executive. But. Uh, this committee is probably the most prolific contributor to this list. But that's really a result of being the most actively um, tuned in committee to this process. 
Oh, the one for funding for maintenance of upkeep of Hudson River Park needs to be dropped. But that's state land and it's not yeah. a city budget issue. Yep. And they keep telling us that every year. Yep. Agreed. I'm going to um, probably convene a, uh, uh, an internal meeting uh, just to review some of these with uh, interested parties, interested members of the community board, just to make notes for the executive committee meeting, uh, not to make any final decisions. Um, I assume that Betty would be interested, but if anyone else is interested, I think Rosa, you've shown some interest in the past uh, for some budget stuff. Everyone, anyone is welcome. Um, what does number seven needs to go to? Yes, yes, and and for those, you know, we don't need a vote. I can I can go ahead and just delete those if they're right because the bike lane is already open, fatigued. so they're not with the pedestrians yeah. anymore. Yeah, and the construction school safety at forty two Trinity. Uh, that's mostly been taken care of. Well, that's still actually an open item for us. Um, there's there's still a need for DOT Hustling. and DOE to come together to do some problem solving to achieve the goal of um, pick up and drop off on the school side. Right. And that's something that I'm hoping the Youth and Education Committee will um, discuss and, and pass a resolution on this month. Right. So, with that, in the absence of hands. Okay, Michael, could you scroll down the web page a little bit? Sorry, I just want to all remind everyone that um, there's a place for new requests. You'll see there's a two new requests that have been added using a form. The form is available if you just scroll down a little bit more. Anyone can use this form. The public, uh, board members. Um, but don't hold back. Let us know what you're thinking. Um, yes, because it is fiscal year 23. And remember that starts in June. I'm sorry, July 1st of 22. And, and um, is this just the beginning of the, the, the budget season? I want to, I just want to remind all the members uh, how much um, the budget makes or breaks um, things that you want. So, you know, there were a number of, Huge policy victories um, in 2019 um, that created, you know, a, a dedicated, you know, placard enforcement unit within the DOT to kind of combat the um, unwillingness of NYPD to enforce itself. Um, that unit was essentially, even though the law still exists, that DOT shall um, uh, may, create and maintain uh, this unit. Uh, their budget was zeroed out, and that is part of an agreement between the mayor and the speaker of the city council in consultation with their members. Um, so it, it's legal fiction because there's no budget for DOT. So the the law is not uh, the spirit of the law is not being upheld because of um, budgetary considerations. So. Um, you know, the best work that we can do to encourage the council to pass laws or not pass laws um, can be completely unwound by the, the passage of a budget that doesn't respect certain programs or initiatives. And um, it's, it's as easy as that to lose a large step forward in everyone's quality of life in Lower Manhattan, because that, that, that DOT unit would have had a field day. They would have they probably would be working, you know, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, just walking through lower Manhattan before they even got out of this neighborhood. Um, but that's not going to happen, at least not this fiscal year, but maybe in the next fiscal year, it's a possibility. And, and we have to lean on our council member and we have to lean on the borough president and we have to encourage our friends and colleagues and other community boards to do the same for things that we want in the budget. So that's the end of my spiel. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Mike. And, and people remind me because the incoming people will be known in November. 
so we can start looking at resolutions or things to start approaching the new group of incoming elected. Yeah, so give them a list of things to fight for budgetarily. And also let me know because the rules and talk about rules changes that are occurring right now. Uh, for bicycles having to stop at crosswalks if a pedestrian's in them, that rule is being reviewed right now and public comment is open on that for the DOT. DOT also has open comment to people on uh, the bill that was passed for DOT to regulate moped share. So those are the two commonly be currently being looked at that are DOT related. If you wanna know more, let me know or our contact Lucian doesn't matter and we'll give you the information and you can certainly opine either by going to their uh, open session or by submitting something written. That's all I have to say. So an absence of hands. Yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes, thank you all for coming and having such a productive meeting. Yeah, thanks, Betty. Thanks, Lucia. Thanks, everyone. All right, good night. Stop in the recording now. So, everybody, good night. Later.